My name is Taeung Baek, director of this center. I'm also a professor of law at the William S. Richardson School of Law. I'm very pleased to host this event titled International Conference, Justice, Identity Politics, and Public Diplomacy uh, with a co-sponsorship of a K Academic Diffusion Research Center at Ina University and the Pacific Asian Legal Studies at the William S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii Manoa. I would like to, first of all, thank uh, Professor Jin Young Lee sitting here, uh, who worked very hard to make this event possible, leading the K Academic Diffusion Research Center members. Without his help and energetic leadership, this conference could not happen. I'm also grateful for the co-sponsorship of the uh, Pacific Asian Legal Studies and uh, the director of the Pacific Asian Legal Studies, uh, Professor Mark Levin, is also present here. Thank you very much. Additionally, I am really thankful for the keynote speaker and other speakers, Professor Han in -Sop, Professor Ko sang -Doo, yes and uh, Professor Yi Hae-kyung, yes, and Professor Na dong and these are uh, working for uh, the, the team, project team, uh, Na dong and Bang mi hwa and uh, uh, Professor Song dong and Professor Yang Mina, and uh, I understand uh, Professor se Lee, Yi se gu is still coming. And uh, I know it is uh, still uh, hard to make international travel, but uh, I'm really grateful for all of you to come all the way to Hawaii. I appreciate my wonderful CKS uh, colleagues who agreed to speak as a discussion at this event. Originally, I was thinking that a couple of uh, uh, colleagues will be uh, available for discussions, but I'm very happy to have uh, six discussions for this uh, session. So thank you, Professor David Krolikowski, Professor Young A Park, Professor uh, Hedian Lee, Professor Mary Kim uh, up there, and uh, Professor uh, Harrison Kim, who is uh, still coming because he has a class. Uh, after class, he will be joining us. And uh, uh, finally, uh, Tony at Law, uh, Che Young Lee. I want to thank also uh, my, uh, to my uh, staff, uh, Courtney Oshirochin, as usual. Hein Lee worked very hard to make everything. And uh, as you know, uh, to process all of the complicated documentation and paperwork is not easy, but uh, they worked very hard uh, to make uh, it happen. And uh, thank you again for your cooperation uh, for those uh, paperwork. Also, we have uh, Ye Jun Kwon and Sung Yeon Song and other uh, student assistant who worked very hard to prepare this uh, conference setup. And they will be continuously working here uh, today to make this event possible. And this event is being recorded after being after editing, this uh, uh, video will be made available through a uh, YouTube channel of the Center for Korean Studies. This event is in part supported by the Academy of Korean Studies Strategic Research Institute program at the University of Hawaii. Of course, uh, in our university's generous, generous support also made this Possible. So I'm looking forward to uh, presentations and uh, very interesting uh, discussions uh, uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the Director Beck. Hello, everybody. Aloha. Why, 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 Korea? When I arrived in Honolulu last Monday, I got caught in the rain. 
Uh, that night, it turned into a heavy rainstorm like a monsoon. The taxi driver told me it had been over 12 years since the last heavy rain like this. Uh, yesterday, uh, the Ina University delegation uh, visited the historical sites uh, related to the first Korean immigrants in Hawaii. Uh, we visited uh, Mokulei Camp, uh, Puiki Cemetery, and Waialua Church in Waialua Sugar Plantation. Uh, we also visited various places in downtown, uh, such as the Korean National Association headquarters, Korean churches, uh, Christian Institute on Waialae, and on Kula Kolea Drive. Uh, Kolea means Korea uh, in the Hawaiian language I learned. Uh, there I heard many words uh, in Hawaiian, uh, particularly uh, Y as suffix. I learned Y means water uh, in Hawaiian. Uh, YY means wealth, riches, assets, prosperity, value as a noun, or to be wealthy, rich, valuable, or useful uh, as an adjective or verb. So Waikiki means, I learned, uh, spouting water or fountain of water. Water is important here in Hawaii, like anywhere else in the world. However, I think the connotation of why seems to be more than just water itself. It is a source of life and an identity of the Hawaiian people. I reflected on the lives and identities of Korean immigrants, not only ethnic identity, but also national identity, gender, religion, and other identities as residents here. As residents of Hawaii, ethnic Koreans seem to have multiple identities like any other immigrants. The daily life of an individual human being is rather more important than any identity assigned by others. The life of an immigrant is itself sublime, and we are here as we are, uh, with our various identities. Today, uh, at this conference, uh, speakers will talk about the lives of immigrants in Korea, as well as Korean immigrants around the world. Uh, migration across national borders has changed the lives of immigrants. As you know, Inha University, Inha comes from Incheon, in and Hawaii's Ha. So as a medium, I hope this conference contributes to mutual understanding between the Center for International Studies of Ina University and the Center for Korean Studies at the University of Hawaii. Uh, through lively discussion, I hope we are all inspired uh, like the fountain of water Waikiki. Uh, I pray for prosperity of this conference, so YY conference, also uh, YY Korea, prosperity of Korean studies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Today's conference will be using this setup, and uh, we have uh, two uh, panels today. And uh, before the two panels, we have a keynote speech uh, prepared. And uh, uh, each, for each uh, panel presentation, we will invite uh, the speaker as well as a uh, uh, discussion on stage. And after uh, each uh, presentation and discussion, if there's any question, we will digest the question, and then we will move to the next paper. And uh, uh, as our keynote speaker, we have uh, Professor Han in Sop from Seoul National University School of Law. Uh, Professor Han in Sop will be speaking on criminal justice prosecution and human rights in South Korea, uh, forward backward dynamics. As you know, Professor Han in Sop uh, had served as a president 
of Korean Institute of uh, Criminology and Justice, and he has uh, extensive experience in dealing with uh, human rights and also law, legal history, and many of interesting uh, issues in legal field, especially uh, these days in Korea, we are ex uh, experiencing a lot of uh, uh, changes in criminal justice system. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from Professor Han. Please come forward. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and introducing me very kindly. Uh, I, I want to tell you uh, what ha what's happening in Korea uh, on the criminal justice prosecution and human rights in South Korea. Yeah, uh, first I focus on key reform issues in the criminal justice and prosecution. Uh, for the reference, uh, I want to cite the book, The Tyranny of Good Intention. Uh, in that book, uh, U.S. Attorney General and later Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson said in 1940, uh, the most dangerous power of the prosecutor is that he picks people he thinks he should get rather than pick the cases that need to be prosecuted. And uh, in such a case, it is another question of discovering uh, the commission of a crime and then looking for the man who has committed it. It is a question of picking uh, the man, and searching the law book, and putting investigators to work to pin some offense on them. It is in this realm in which prosecutor picks some person whom he dislikes or desires to embarrass or select some group of unpopular person, and then look for the offense that the greatest danger of the abuse of prosecuting power lies. Uh, such an expression is very re realistic in uh, Korean uh, situation. Uh, and some of the critics, uh, critics uh, uh, cite this, uh, this expression uh, as a ground for uh, monitoring the prosecutorial power. Uh, there has been accumulating criticisms about the prosecution practices, like uh, they are biased and unfair, and targeting persons rather than cases, manipulating investigation with political intention. There is no institutional check on the prosecution itself and abusive investigation techniques often make human rights imprisonment and defense difficult. There can be some sanctuary free from investigation. So prosecutorial power. On the one hand, uh, some kind of cases uh, are approached uh, by very offensive expansion and pressure. Uh, the prosecutors say, if you don't cooperate with the investigation, I will show you the hard taste. If not cooperated, the prosecutor's investigation will be extended not only to other cases, but his family members. Even though it is not a serious case and evidence is weak, prosecute it to feel pain and financial burden. On the other hand, uh, some cases are omitted, delayed, and minimized. Uh, in such a case, uh, try to cover the crime or delay the investigation. Only minor parts of the various uh, uh, serious criminal charges are prosecuted. Even if prosecuted, pay less attention to uh, maintaining the prosecution, uh, like uh, Kwak Sang-do uh, case. Uh, in recent times, the politicization of the prosecution uh, is commonly uh, criticized. Uh, prosecutors have previously 
been called the mainstay or maid of the power. But now, currently, prosecution itself becoming a powerful interest group of its own. Uh, in the past, it was used as a tool for politics, but now it tried to uh, have the direct influence on real politics. Uh, you know, someone, uh, someone comment it can be emergence of prosecutors' regime. Uh, like in Brazil's example. And what kind of uh, techniques of abuse investigation? All the times, torture. But now, no more torture, no more physical torture. But some uh, enhancing techniques can be used. Detention-oriented investigation. Securing evidence centering on the investigative protocol. And intimidation through confidential interviews, or threatening to expand separate case, other case, uh, extensive search and seizure of digital evidence, investigating late and night, even uh, until dawn. Uh, the, for the last uh, five years, some reform achievement uh, has been made. First, on the investigation techniques, uh, the attorney's right to assist. When a suspect is interrogated, now the lawyer can sit next to him and take notes, take uh, using a uh, notebook computer and point out the way of investigation. And the late night investigation, uh, now the investigation must be closed before uh, 9, 9 p.m. at most. No more exposure to photo lines for the express. No disclose of the suspected fact. Yeah, it's a reform uh, has been made. Uh, second is uh, police uh, role uh, has been changed from assistant to primary investigator. Before, uh, prosecutors has the authority to investigate all cases and to command and supervise the police investigation. Uh, police, although they actually carry out most of 90% of the investigation, they are legally assistant to the prosecutor. But now the police has primary investigative authority in all cases. Uh, Prosecution confirm, confirm, confirms after closing the police investigation. Uh, primary investigation is, is narrowed uh, to uh, some special cases. Uh, restrictions on the scope of prosecution's primary investigation. Uh, the two years ago, six types of uh, uh, serious crimes uh, uh, can uh, pro prosecutors uh, have uh, uh, primary investigation. Last year, the scope is uh, narrowed to uh, narrowed only two kinds of uh, crime: corruption crime and economic crime. Uh, CIO is a uh, Korean language Gongsucha. Gongsucha uh, newly established uh, two years ago. Uh, CIO target high-ranking officers' uh, crime, judges' crime, prosecutors' crime, high police officers' crime, military generals. The uh, crime is public officers' occupational crime. But the number of CIO prosecutors uh, narrowed not more than 25%. It's a law. Uh, it's authority. Uh, in the case of judges, prosecutors, and police, uh, the authority for investigation, prosecution, and maintenance of uh, prosecution. In the case of other public officers, uh, CIO has the authority to uh, only investigation. After investigation, uh, the case should be sent to the uh, prosecutors for prosecution. 
Now, uh, many uh, people uh, uh, do not satisfy uh, the CIO's uh, activity. And uh, uh, CIO needs to develop specialized investigation techniques and organization man- management is required. Uh, what's the uh, uh, special feature of a uh, CIO? The key is how to check the prosecution's pow- power because the police and prosecutors can also investigate other high-ranking officers. Uh, now we move to criminal justice statistics for human rights in Korea, uh, long-term trends. Uh, in order to read the climate of the change, climate of the year, uh, how much changes. The first, uh, for the reference, I want to cite the constitutional law scholar, Paul Freund. He one, once said, U.S. Supreme Court should never be influenced by the weather of the day. Today, clouded, today, more raining, today is very cold. But Supreme Court ne- never be influenced by the weather of the day. But inevitably, they will be influenced by the climate of the year. What does climate of the year mean? Freund suggested it is one of increasing sensitivity toward human rights and large conception of equality uh, under law. Uh, some uh, Korean Supreme Court decision, uh, we can find the similar uh, expression, like, unlike uh, from one case I cite, uh, unlike legislation, an administration dominated by majority rule, justice, the judiciary, and the court is meaningful when it serves as the last bastion to protect minorities and guarantee the basic rights of the people, away from many political, religious, and social interests. And the final, it is the role and the duty of the court whose mission is to protect the rights of the minorities guarantee human rights to enable transgender people to be legally recognized for their true gender identity as equal member of our society. Uh, the first uh, on the statistics of uh, death penalty, Korea is a unique evolutionist uh, country in practice in East Asian world. Uh, Korea not executed for 20 years uh, since 1998. Uh, we call it the facto evolutionist country. Death penalty sentence, final judgment is reduced to one or two cases per year. The draft to abolish death penalty has been always pending at the National Assembly. First time in 2020, 44 UN um, a moratorium of death penalty, and second time la- last year, uh, under Yun Sogyal government, also voted for UN moratorium. Korea is surrounded by retentionist countries like uh, 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 in European nations, all nations are evol- evolutionist legally, but uh, uh, South Korea uh, uh, is surrounded by North Korea, China, Japan, U.S., and uh, Vietnam. All nations except Korea has executed some death penalty. Uh, the numbers of detained person uh, by the detention warrant issued by the judge. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, more than 140,000 people were detained uh, for the trial, but now less than uh, 20,000 uh, persons uh, were on the trial 
without detention. Yeah, it's a great achievement, I think so. And new issues is rising. Uh, she's a, a, a search is rapidly increasing, and the court uh, are preparing for the to be uh, substantially contro controlling. Uh, how about minor rights at the Constitutional Court? Korean Constitutional Court uh, has made a great contribution uh, to enhance human rights standard uh, by uh, repealing, uh, uh, repealing uh, the bad law uh, or inappropriate uh, laws. I skip uh, everything. Mm. Yeah, I want to show uh, one uh, short summary. Uh, in, in, under the Korean law, you know, we punish the uh, adultery and to punish, punish it, conscientious objection in the military and no voting rights for prisoners and the punish same-sex sexuality in the military. Uh, uh, such a case uh, were, uh, was made by uh, was dealt, dealt in a constitutional court by the uh, constitutional complaint. Uh, it's very curious. Within very short time, short time, uh, many cases from constitutional to unconstitutional case. In America, it is not possible because the uh, Supreme Court justice uh, justice uh, uh, term is a lifelong, but in Korea uh, only six years term. And in 1990, uh, she mean, means the constitutional vote, you means the unconstitutional vote. Uh, in in case uh, about the ten years effort. <laughs> About ten, ten, after ten years, uh, ten years, the constitutional decision uh, was reversed uh, to unconstitutional. Uh, yeah, my question is: uh, uh, such a change in short period, uh, what is possible and the driving force behind it? First, the term of office of Supreme Court Justice and constitutional judge is six years. Uh, one more term, two more term is legally possible, but in fact, no one, uh, no one enjoys the second term. Only uh, judges can have uh, six years term. New judges can review all previous decisions. Maybe the Constitutional Court should make appropriate amount of unconstitutional decisions in order to maintain its social influence, appropriate <laughs> amount of unconstitutional decisions are needed. And past the constitutional decisions include decent opinions. The opposing opinion compete with majority uh, opinion for civil persuasion and the argument of opposing opinion immediately be widespread. And after 10 years, we know all the rationale uh, for opposing uh, opinion and become opposing opinion become the impetus for future majority argument. The victims of human rights violations uh, continue to file constitutional complaints. Major cases reviewed every six years. The accumulation of constitutional complaints becomes the pressure factor that cannot be ignored. In the long run, the changes in Supreme Court, Constitutional Court decision reflect and express the climate of the year, I think so. And advances in transitional justice, uh, retrial and innocent judgment on the past wrongful judicial decisions and the military dictatorship. Uh, uh, in May 18th case, the, uh, in 1980, the citizens, the protest, 
testing citizens was severely punished. But after uh, 15 years, the uh, coup d'etat leader, John Duan and No Tao, the former president, was punished. The uh, greatly reversed. And after that, the seven citizens uh, were uh, judicially uh, dead, uh, but they, the, we call it the Imin Heng Myang uh, but uh, after 30 years, they were uh, retried and uh, innocent, uh, found innocent. And uh, Jo Bong Ham, the famous opposition political leader, uh, he was uh, uh, judicially executed, but 10 years ago, Supreme Court reversed on the original decision and found innocent. Such a reversal and uh, uh, from severe punishment to uh, innocent uh, uh, reversal decisions, uh, now enumerate more than uh, 1,000 cases. Uh, they were originally severe, severely punished, death, life, long-term imprisonment. Uh, but now, the innocent decision, uh, some, some cases are uh, uh, crime not committed. Uh, law was uh, unconstitutional. Well, there can be justifiable uh, reason. And the proof uh, was not well insufficient. Uh, compassion and the torture are ir illegal situation. In such a case, uh, innocent. Uh, I want to uh, uh, refer to uh, one uh, event uh, who initiated some changes in prosecutor's demand at ritual case. Uh, prosecutor Im Jung. Uh, asked the court firstly to learn it, uh, not to uh, rule in accordance with law and uh, principles. Uh, he, uh, she said, I, as a prosecutor, express apology on the prosecution's past wrongs. I respect those who courageously fought for democracy. Please acquit the accused. And she was disciplined as a four months suspension of job. And after five years of uh, judicial struggle, the decision was reversed, and she, uh, uh, she, uh, she found uh, uh, no, no uh, disciplinary measure. After that, prosecution's attitude is changed. In the obvious case, instead of evasive demand, yes, uh, uh, not guilty demand is sought and avoid automatic uh, repeals. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, want, I comment some uh, concluding remarks. I was involved in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, involved in uh, the chairperson uh, of the Judicial Reform Committee and uh, the in the white paper of its work, I wrote, reform is not a task can be achieved by uh, one or two people. No matter how urgent you are, you can take 10 steps at once. Reform refers to a continuous process of taking a cool look uh, at the uh, surrounding situation and advancing one step at once while having a vision that looks 100 steps ahead. Sometimes we are disappointed, uh, but it's a, a long-term uh, journey. Okay, uh, I, con I conclude m uh, my speech by the time pressure. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any question for today's keynote speaker? Otherwise, uh, we will uh, proceed. Uh, by the way, 
Uh, Professor Insop Han was the person who uh, worked very hard to introduce the current uh, law school system in Korea and a lot of uh, criminal uh, justice reform measures. And according to his presentation, a lot of changes had happened last uh, years. But still a lot of things to be done, I think. So uh, this will be a good opportunity for us to think about where Korea is located in terms of criminal justice and human protection of human rights. So I will invite Professor Jin Young Lee to moderate the first session. Thank you. Good afternoon again. Uh, the, the first panel is about immigration, migration, and social integration in Korea. Uh, actually, uh, we have time limit. Um, each speaker uh, only have 15 minutes, and the discussant uh, has only five minutes. Uh, so I just omit any introduction uh, of the each speaker and discussant. So when you speak uh, about uh, your topic, uh, you will introduce yourself, please. Uh, first, uh, I invite uh, Professor Sang Du Ko. Uh, he's talking about uh, the social integration of for me, former uh, foreign immigrants in South Korea. Um, hello, good afternoon. My name is Ko Sang Du from Yonsei University. The topic of my presentation today is social integration of foreign immigrants in the South Korean local community. Uh, first, the history background. Um, the division of roles in immigrant policy, there are two uh, players in immigrant policy, central government and local government. And the role of central government is a uh, policy decision maker and the role of local government is policy implementer. So central government decide the policy and plan the program for immigrant and they ask local government to implement. They uh, giving money or budget to the local government mostly 50% matching fund, and sometimes 100% the uh, budget coverage. So um, there is some, uh, we need readjustment of roles between central and local governments. Uh, we are talking about uh, that more authority and responsibility to local government because it can lead to more efficiency of immigration, immigrant fraud policy. So uh, the, my goal, my risk goal, and my case selection is, first my risk goal is, I would like to uh, explain how the cooperative structure of immigrant policy has changed in South Korea especially between central and local governments, and sometimes between local and local governments. So the cases, I have selected two cases. The first case is National Council of Multicultural Cities, NCMC, and this is a cooperative body of, of, between local and local governments, horizontal cooperation. And the second case is um, Multicultural Immigrant Plus Center, MIPC. It is a cooperative body for uh, cooperation between local and central government. So, conceptual discussion. Um, I'd like to use the governance as my analytical framework uh, governance is defined as various actors at multiple levels, local level, national level, and uh, um, international level, and various actors at uh, multi uh, multiple levels. So the Marx um, investigated the EU case study 
and he found three different dimensions of the European Union in the governance of the European Union. Transnational is the, the, the supranational level, transnational. And the national level is the member countries of the EU and local government, the three dimensions in the European governance. And Piatoni found additional dimension of the governance. It is external, international uh, dimension of the governance. So he found three dimensions, decentralization, globalization, and public-private cooperation. And Bach and Flinders reduced the dimensions to two dimensions for parsimony of his research. It is a central local dimension and government civil society dimensions. So uh, he focused on the domestic aspect of the governance. This is the two ideal types of governance developed by Hugh and Marx. Here you can find the uh, two types of ideal type. The um, left uh, below is type one, control type of governance. And then right uh, above is uh, participate, participative uh, governance. So the control type had the characteristic of the vertical dimension. It has a top down from central to local government, government. And the cooperation on the horizontal level, there is separation. There are little cooperation between local and local government or little cooperation between local government and uh, civil society. And uh, here, type two, participated governance has two characteristics. It is a uh, bottom-up, right, from local to central government. And then the horizontally, uh, there is very well coordinated, good coordination. So there are two ideal types and in their reality, every country has different or various types of governance in between. This is the, um, the types of the governance um, I found very relevant to my study or research of the Korean cases. Here had four types of governance. The left one, left two is good governance, and right two types are bad governance. The good governance here, multi-level governance uh, here above, is, you can see here, the, the, the line is um, the, the good connection, and that line is uh, little connection. And here, uh, multi-level governance, there are uh, good cooperation or good connection between central and local, and also good connection among uh, local uh, government. And localist type, there are good connections among local government, but very little connections between central and local, right? And right side, here, the centralist type, there's a good connection between central and local, but decoupling uh, governance, there are uh, connections neither horizontally nor um, vertically. So in my view, Korean case is a centralist type uh, in terms of governance today. And to which direction Korean immigrant policy or immigration uh, governance is going to? It is my research question. And, and my argument is um, 
Korea is going from centrist type to the multi-level type of governance, um, despite some limitations, some weaknesses. This is some statistics, statistics about Korean uh, immigrants, immigrants in Korean society. There are about 2 million uh, foreign immigrants in Korea. The definition of immigrant is the people who live in Korea more than six months, right? So uh, 2 million means about 4% of the whole Korean population. And the OECD defines the 5% of the population immigrant is a multicultural society. So Korea is entering the multicultural society now. And I think in the near future, Korea will be a multicultural society in terms of OECD uh, definition. And the uh, most half of foreign immigrants live in metropolitan area, which means Seoul, Gyeonggi, Incheon. There are four main types of immigrants. And foreign workers account for 32% of uh, immigrants in Korea. And then marriage immigrant, and 10%, they're together 42%, and then foreign, foreign student, 8%, and Korean expat, uh, 17%. So altogether, uh, 100%. I have um, investigated the whole immigrant uh, program in 2021, it was about 608 programs for immigrants in Korea. And most of them are targeted for multicultural family. It means the women of the international marriage. So 437 uh, programs are targeted for multicultural family. And then 77 for foreign residents, the general and then 50 for foreign workers, and 25 foreign students, and 11 programs for children of immigrants, and four Korean expats, and then four for Korean public officials who are in charge of immigrant policy. And this is the um, category of the program. The more than 60 programs um, is related with center or festival or homeland visit. So I call them more event program, right? Uh, e event program for immigrants. And more than 51 programs are for uh, guest workers. And then experience, counseling, associating, and 21, uh, between 21 and 30 programs, Korean language education, health, and medication, tourism, et cetera. And the least uh, programs are uh, related with uh, multicultural understanding, volunteer, capacity building, council, youth camp, mentoring, brokerage, human rights, translation, cognition improvement. So you can see here the very important um, um, topics for foreign immigrants. Um, who Korean government has very uh, few programs for these topics. And lastly, I'll talk about the two cases. The first case is the National Council of Multicultural Cities. It is, as I said, the uh, consultative organization of local governments. Uh, the aiming at sharing policy and experiences and policy proposal to central government. The, its model uh, is European Multicultural City Council and Japanese Multicultural City Council was the model for this uh, 
ACMP. It was founded in 2012, uh, initiated by Gurogu in Seoul, um, at the beginning, uh, 24 cities participated in the founding, and today there are 27 member cities, so adding three cities. Uh, uh, and then the qualification for membership is more than 10,000 immigrants in the city, or 3% of the population in the related cities. And the second uh, case is a Multicultural Immigrant Plus Center. It is a one-stop administrative service center uh, because there is a fragmentation of central government in Korea, Ministry of Justice, Family, Education, Employment, Security. So the immigrants should visit all different departments, ministry, to uh, work, uh, to make, to have a business or affairs. So to get services for stay, work permit, language program, children, counseling, etc. So there are, it was opened first in 2017 in Ansan city, but today uh, we have 22 centers. But the problem is that the role of a local government is limited. The local government only hosts the center space operating management, and the central government come and open the service counter for immigrants. In conclusion, um, local government in Korea is now supporter of central government, but is becoming to the partner. And the, the immigrant uh, policy governance has been changed from centralist type to multi-level governance uh, type, as I argued. Um, the NCMC, the founding of the NCMC, it has improved the horizontal connection of the immigrant governance, and MIPC improved the vertical connection of the governance. But there are some limitations. The weak vertical connection in NCMC there is a good cooperation among local governments, but still a uh, weak uh, connection between central and local government. And weak leadership role of the local government in MI. Thank you for this illuminating paper. I'd like to preface my remarks by clarifying that I am a scholar of modern Korean literature. So in other words, I have not been trained in the field of political science and therefore cannot honestly offer an expert opinions on the contributions of this research. So instead, I will briefly summarize the argument as I understood it and pose a number of general questions about immigrant policy in contemporary South Korea to engender a broader discussion of the topic. And so the paper begins with an overview of different modes of immigrant policy governance. And according to the review of literature that is provided, the majority of existing conceptual models, so multi-layer, centralist, localist, etc., were developed based on studies carried out on Western Europe. Um, to borrow from this terminology, the model that seems to have been adopted in contemporary South Korea is centralist. Most immigrant policy is controlled by the central government through agencies that include the Ministry of Justice, the Ministry of Employment and Labor, the Ministry of Public Administration and Security. Overall, the paper is quite critical of this arrangement, noting issues, and I quote, insufficient cooperation among local governments as well as uncoordinated designation by the central government. The issue of immigrant policy, of course, is become increasingly important. As noted, a total of 2.22 million immigrants lived in South Korea in 2019, a 7.9% jump from the previous year, and a figure that accounts for 4.3% of the national population. Unfortunately, the picture of South Korean governance that is painted by the paper is one of dysfunction, in which local governments find themselves unable to cooperate with one another and dictate policy 
to address the needs of their local communities. So here are three questions for the paper, for um, Professor Go. The beginning of the paper you state, and I quote, efforts to readjust, to readjust the division of the roles between the central and local governments will increase the efficiency of immigrant policies. I was wondering if you could explain further what you mean by efficiency in this context, particularly in the relation in relation to the issue of immigrant policies, as opposed to you know efficiency and governance in general. So that's the first question. And the second question is: throughout the paper, you include several suggestions to help address systemic governance issues. For example, you state, and I quote. It is necessary to institutionalize coordination among government ministries, end quote, to reduce redundancy in programs. And you also suggest, quote, the central government should transfer more authority uh, to local governments, end quote. And so I'm just wondering, in your professional opinion, how realistic are these suggestions and when might we see these changes take place? And asking from a, just a position of complete ignorance. And my third and final question is, in the paper, you note that the policies of local governments, quote, overwhelmingly focus on multicultural families, whereas uh, policies, whereas very few policies in comparison target foreign workers, international students, and Korean expatriates. I was wondering if you could explain what is the historical reason for this predominant focus on multicultural families? And why are local governments comparatively less interested in other types of immigrants? Thank you once again for sharing this paper, and I look forward to your responses. Thank you very much. Uh, so is there any question from the floor? Oh, yes, we have two questions. Short questions, please. Let me give you. Hi, thank you very much for a very interesting paper. I just um, have a question regarding the degree of representation by some of the immigrants in you know, these programs and in debates about the policy or provisions of services. So I see that these two organizations that you're talking about are basically organizations that have sort of government kind of entities that provide assistance, but at the same time, you know, I really think it would be interesting to look at are these organizations actually have some representation from the immigrants themselves in a capacity to be able to influence the direction of the policy and service provisions? You are very tall. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for your um, comment. And you made three questions. First question is, what is the definition of the policy efficiency? Uh, if we talk about efficiency, it is actually cost efficiency. And efficiency means uh, it is efficient to achieve our goal with less, uh, less cost. So. Um, the more, uh, so uh, the efficiency is actually the ratio of input and output. So more output and less input is efficient, right? So in my uh, immigrant governance, the, there is, I think there is the um, budget consuming problem, it is money consuming um, in immigrant policy, I would like to pinpoint uh, one example, the Korean language course. Uh, there are many four different ministries. The Ministry for Family, they decide the program, plan program, and ask for local government to implement the Korean language course with money, budget, uh, targeted for, for multicultural family. That means women of the international marriage. And the Ministry of the Employment, they planned a Korean language course for guest workers 
with the party. And Ministry of the Justice, they also planned the Korean language course for uh, multicultural family and foreign, get, uh, foreign workers. And then Ministry of the Education, uh, also Korean language course for every foreigners. So there's the overlapping planning of the programs and waste of money, right? So um, in this sense, we sh- if we want to improve our governance, then, then we can reduce the, this uh, budget waste. The second question is the possibility, the possibility of the decentralization in Korea in my mind, there are two factors. Two factors are significant for the future decentralization of the immigrant uh, governance. First uh, factor is the current Korean government is planning to establish immigration services new, as new agencies. And I'm not sure, but after establishing this agency, uh, probably. Uh, it will occur, it will happen, the decentralization, or maybe on the other way around. And the second uh, factor is Korea is becoming the multicultural society, and after becoming multicultural society, uh, multicultural society means the distinction between uh, foreign immigrant and native citizens is discrimination, right? So all people, uh, whether immigrant or natives, they need social integration. Social integration is not uh, specifically targeted for the foreigners or foreign immigrants, right? It is discrimination. So after becoming a multicultural society in Korea, the central government should have less interest in social integration policy or immigrant policy, and the local government should take the responsibility and authority of the social integration in their own community, right? It is not the domain of the central government, the immigrant policy. Then the third question is, why there is different interest in different immigrant types, right? Multicultural uh, family, foreign workers, and foreign students, and Korean expats. Because the Koreans or Korean government had different perceptions towards the foreigners. And multicultural family, they are foreigners, but Korean government think or regard they are Koreans because they married with a Korean, uh, um, Korean man. So um, they, the central, central and local government has more, uh, more care for the multicultural um, uh, families, and we have... Uh, more programs for them. And Korean expat, for them, the Korean government think they don't need any social integration program. They can have, they, they have a good um, language um, capacity. They don't need any Korean language course, etc. They don't need any social integration program. And in between, foreign workers, and the foreign students, they are really foreigners. They will go back to their home country. So we don't need to uh, spend budget for them. Right? So there are different interests in different types of the immigrant or foreigners. And the question, um, your question is the, the role of immigrant in the policy making process in Korea. Um, there is very little participation of the foreign immigrant in the po- uh, policy 
pro making process, but there is some trend in Korean government. Uh, they want to include the foreign immigrant in the policy making process, especially in the program planning and then program monitoring. So, um, every year, the local government conducted a survey of the, the satisfaction of, the, uh, of uh, these uh, target groups in their programs, etc. And there is officially, there is a consultative uh, council um, participated by public officials and academics and immigrants. But in my observation, this council meeting is very rare in their practice, so it should be improved. And actually, I didn't, uh, I couldn't uh, understand, understand your questions. What are your questions? Doing this yet, but I'd be curious to see if there are differences between the immigrant groups in their acculturation to Korea. In other words, Vietnamese versus uh, Filipino versus. Ah, uh, you mean difference of the uh, the origin, origin, yeah. Yeah. country origin yeah. difference. Um, I talked about two millions uh, foreign uh, immigrant. And, and I third, I think a third of them are uh, Korean Chinese. And they are not targeted in the immigrant pro program. And otherwise, there I, in my understanding, there are no big difference in program planning or policy planning um, based on the uh, origin of the countries. OK, thank you very much. Uh, please, big applause to the first speaker and discussant. Uh, because the schedule is really hectic, so <laughs> I invite the second speaker, Professor Hagen Lee, please. OK, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Hae Kyung Lee. Uh, I am a professor emeritus in Pese University. It means that I just retired uh, my university. <laughs> uh, anyway, today I want to present current status and issues of a migrant worker program in South Korean agriculture. I uh, this one I can which way? Ah, okay. My contents is like this. Then, uh, goals of my presentation, I wanted to address current status and issues of migrant worker program in South Korean agriculture, focusing on the new uh, seasonal migrant worker program in South Korea. I wanted to explore the influence of a new program within the wider context of Korean labor immigration policy. I wanted to raise two questions. Uh, the first question is, why is the Ministry of Justice initiating this new program instead of the uh, Ministry of Employment and Labor? I wanted to call this uh, ministry later, Ministry of Labor. Uh, anyway, my second question is, what are the implications of this new program for wider South Korean labor immigration policy? So as a background, I want to uh, just to tell you the immigration policy in South Korea. I think you already know about uh, South Korean immigration policy well. Anyway, uh, 1993, the industrial training system was introduced in South Korea. In 2004, the employment permit system operated alongside the industrial training system. In year 2007, these two systems unified into the employment permit system. Then we also have the working visit system for co-ethnic workers. 
So currently, our labor immigration policy is the employment permit system. I usually call the EPS. Under the EPS umbrella, we have two tracks. One is general EPS for Southeastern ASEAN. The other one is a special EPS for co-ethnic workers. So now I want to talk, uh, tell you uh, what is EPS in the agricultural sector. In Korea, agricultural sector used to be a traditional, pre-modern sector which kept declining during the inter industrialization and development. When labor shortage in agriculture became an issue during mid-1990, there was a need for allocation of industrial training to these areas. However, our government decided no allowance. It was only when the EPS was introduced in 2004 that foreign workers were officially assigned to farming areas. So you can see figure two, this is, uh, EP, uh, EPS system is a sort of a quarter system. So sort of a uh, we have a committee that decide how many EPS workers and uh, what quota for each uh, industry. So usually it only shows uh, agriculture and uh, agriculture. So in the beginning, 2004, uh, we, uh, the red color is the percent and uh, green, uh, the blue color is the uh, the number. So in 2004, we have about 2,000 workers in the farming area. That is only 8%. But recently, last year, we have about uh, more than uh, 8,000 EPS workers in farm area that account about 14%. With EPS quota for the agriculture given less than half of the demand for labor for near two decades, farming community have become swamped with undocumented migrant workers. So now I want to talk about new program and its current status. Unlike uh, rice farming and some livestock farming, the demand for labor in most dry field farming is seasonal. Therefore, hiring of foreign worker uh, throughout the year under the EPS system has been criticized as being inefficient because uh, in Korea we have a full season, so during winter time we don't need to work in dry, uh, dry field farming. Since 2014, uh, several farming associations, including Kwesangun, Nakt government ministry door, and requested for new program about inviting seasonal workers in farming areas. At first, they visited the Ministry of Labor. However, that ministry rejected the idea. After several requests, the Ministry of Justice and Ministry of Agriculture opened a pilot program in Kwesan Gun. In 2015, Kwesan Gun was able to invite Chinese workers for two months during the fall kimchi making season for the salt pickled cabbage business. In, in Korea, we call a uh, kimjang, a uh, jorim kimjang bechu, that is a uh, salt pickled cabbage business. This became the first pilot program of seasonal migrant worker program. Another case was held in Boungun, but it is interesting. Kwesangun and Boungun both located in Chungcheong, Bukdo, uh, central part of Korea. The project was to bring their sibling to South Korea for two months uh, to promote goodwill with their hometown, which became one of a successful second pilot program. So you can see the number of PLZ and number of seasonal migrant workers. So first year, that is a pilot project. Only Kwesangun started the program, 19 Chinese uh, invited. The next year, Boungun and uh, four more uh, local government participated. But look at the year two, 2019. We have uh, 50 local government participated and around us. Uh, 3,500 workers uh, work in our farm area. But if you look at the year 2020, no one can enter Korea due to the uh, pandemic. Then year 2021, only uh, 500 seasonal migrant workers worked in Korea. So last year, uh, although the uh, Ministry of Justice allocated uh, 100 local government and 
near 10,000 uh, workers, but in actually uh, only 80 local government and around 6,200 seasonal migrant workers in our rural area. So now talk about issues. In my paper, I wrote five uh, issues. The first one is labor shortage. The second one, uh, second one and third one in a seasonal migrant worker program has two way of inviting seasonal migrant workers. The first one is MOU method, but that method has some problem, usually involvement of brokers. The second, uh, uh, second method is using, utilizing family members of marriage migrants that uh, arose from the Boungun case, but the, some problem uh, by, by that is difficulty in selection because someone came to rural area, he or she does not have any experience in agriculture, something like that. Then the fourth one is a problem with the runaway workers. And the lastly, I talk, uh, I talk about management issue under the new program. But due to the time limitation, I just want to focus on labor shortage. The aging phenomena in, is very critical in rural areas. For example, the proportion of elderly population over age 65 uh, is 17% in overall South Korea, but 47% uh, in rural area in 2021. Although labor shortage is not new phenomena in Korea's agriculture, uh, it is more serious due to COVID pandemic. So if you look at the figure four, the first two bar shows you percent of age 65 and over farm, among farm population. And the second bar shows you a percent of age 75 years old and over among farm population. How old? <laughs> but uh, another shock is the, second, uh, the last two bar that is among farm owners. So first one, uh, the third one shows you 60% uh, of farm owners are over age 65, and 27% of farm owners are age 75. So during the pandemic period, the government, because during the pandemic period, our rural area is serious uh, labor shortage, this, uh, therefore the government tried to relocate of an unemployed people to work in the rural areas. However, these efforts were not very successful. It is because of an unemployed people were reluctant to stay and work in rural areas. For example, uh, I visited uh, uh, year 2020, June, I visited Jinan. So I met several farmers there, but anyway, you know, uh, Jinan, uh, we have called Mujinjang, Muju, Jinang, uh, Mujinjang, Changsu. That is a somewhat <laughs> a remote area from urban a city. But anyway, the farmer told me, usually it will take, uh, she asked me, very short time, right? So just to read it, this interview, okay. But anyway, uh, the farmer uh, also very unsatisfied, uh, uh, the uh, urban unemployed people. So now let's talk about this question part. In my paper, I want to explore the influence of this new program within the wider context of Korean labor immigration policy. So the first question was why uh, the Ministry of Justice initiating this new program instead of Ministry of Labor? And the second question is what are the implications of this new program? So regarding the first question, Korean uh, Immigration Service under the Ministry of Justice was a key player handling immigration policy in the past. However, that ministry lost its influence due to the failure of the industrial training system. Thus, the department is eager to regain its importance, which now causing conflict between Ministry of Justice and Ministry of Labor. Since Justice Minister Han announced some plans including a new central bureau overseeing immigration policy to cope with demographic challenge uh, several times last year, the bait is growing and very hot in Korea. 
Regarding the second question, the new program was initiated by the demand of the region. So from uh, bottom up, uh, which is not the usual top-down process in South Korea. The new program is further progressing toward uh, the public uh, seasonal migration worker program and region-specific visa program. So first, I want to explain what is public seasonal migrant worker program. It's a pilot program uh, conducted last year in which local agricultural cooperative we call Nonghyap or Jiyok Nonghyap, local Nonghyap, hire seasonal migrant workers and dispatch them to local farms very short period one day or two day, something like that. So the pros are, since the agricultural cooperative is now managing 30 to 40 seasonal migrant workers together, it became a win and win for both. But in order to uh, give you more background, I want to explain uh, this one first. So what was, the, uh, ser what was the big and serious problem under the EPS is, uh, regarding on the farm sector is that farmhouse often provide greenhouse or container as accommodation for uh, foreign workers. So there was an accident. A Cambodian female, uh, E9 workers, EPS workers died while sleeping in vinyl greenhouse December year 2020. December is very cold in South Korea. So this photo shows the greenhouse where the accident occurred. So even after the tragic incident, accommodation situation has not been improved. Actually, the Ministry of uh, Labor uh, asked the farm owners, uh, they cannot provide the vineyard house and they cannot provide the container. But they usually hire three or four or one or two uh, EPS workers. So if they put uh, these foreign workers in town hall or rent a, a house in town hall, the town hall and this work site is far away. So even though they use a, a bicycle, it takes about 30 minutes to come to work site. So the foreign worker also complain because they have only one, one hour break in the morning and one hour lunch time and one hour afternoon break. They cannot go to their uh, how, uh, room and back and forth, it is very uh, difficult for them. So there was that kind of uh, complaint on uh, both sides. So let's look at this. This one is a seasonal migrant worker program guideline of occupation got very strict. So farmhouse which, pro uh, which provide a container or vineyard house cannot apply the program. So this one shows you the farmhouse under the new program provides a pre-made house. <laughs> they keep asking me, <laughs> stopping. <laughs> okay, a new one-year pilot project for region-specific visa program is running, which encourages migrants to settle in those regions with a steeper population decline. So, I want to skip this part. <laughs> as you want. Anyway, recently, South Korean immigration policy are facing into a new turning point. I feel we had the first turning point in uh, 2004 with uh, President Noh Moo-hyun. So I hope uh, this can be a, a really a, a second turning point. I hope so, but we have to wait until what happened. Anyway, the Seasonal Migrant Worker Program is one of the aspects which trigger the shift. However, it is important to keep an eye on the range of the shift. Developing more long-term strategy for demographic and immigration policy is needed. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Young Up Park in Asian Studies Department. Um, Thank you, Professor Lee, for this wonderful paper. Um, this paper makes a significant contribution to the literature on migrant labor in South Korea because migrant workers in the agricultural sector is an underexplored topic. Um, by the way, I study North Korean migrants in South Korea, so I'm not an expert in migrant labor, but I'll try here. Um, in addition to you know this 
most significant contribution that I mentioned, I think this paper makes unique contribution to the literature on migrant workforce in Korea for the following reasons. Uh, first, the author explores the inter-ministry level competition that led to the Ministry of Justice's initiation of the Seasonal Migrant Workers Program. And this behind the scene conflict between uh, these two ministries provides important insights into the workings of governmental agencies and how they conceptualize the problems and solutions concerning agricultural migrant labor. Um, we tend to think about the government and the state as a monolithic entity in our analyses, but this study shows that that's not the case. Um, second, the author foregrounds the important role that local governments play in implementing migrant-related policies. Although I'm familiar with migrant literature concerning South Korea, I haven't read a lot about the local governments that are engaged in management of migrant workers program. So this focus in the paper as to our understanding of the complex workings of the government on multiple levels. Um, so in general, my suggestion is to foreground these points in the paper so the readers become aware of these major contributions um, to the existing literature. Um, I have a few questions and comments. Uh, first, um, I'm wondering how the role of civil society actors factor into the equation. There is a large and growing literature on multiculturalism in South Korea, and uh, the general scholarly consensus is that it is an incomplete and uneven process buoyed by pressure from below in the form of civil society activism. So I'd like to ask the author to address the relationship between the civil society actors, local governments, and the central government. Um, second, the author explores Bongun local government's recruitment of the relatives of my, uh, marriage migrants as agricultural workers. Existing literature shows that the status and experiences of marriage migrants and migrant workers are vastly different. And it's interesting to see how the, uh, there are local projects bringing migrant workers and marriage migrants together as part of these kinship networks. Um, the author discusses the negative aspect of this program in that the migrant workers who come lack farming experiences and, the, and that the relatives of these migrant workers, quote, meddle excessively with the personal management, unquote. Uh, this, of course, is a perspective of the employers, but if you take into consideration the perspective of the workers, I wonder if this program may be looked at more positively. Um, for the employers, intervention by the relatives of these migrant workers might be viewed as quote-unquote meddling, but from the migrant workers' perspective, it's their familial network stepping in to prevent further human rights abuses. Um, third, the author discusses ethnic return migrants uh, participating in the seasonal migrant workers program. Um, but ethnic return migrants, especially Chosanjo workers, have Korean language fluency and tend to seek employment in the service sector in the urban area. So I wonder why they would actually seek employment in the agricultural uh, area. And I, um, I hope the author can elaborate on this. Lastly, I think it would be helpful to have a few paragraphs about how migrant agriculture work in Korea fare when compared to other counterparts in other Asian countries. Overall, I think this was a very informative and insightful paper, and I hope to see it published in the new, near future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Park. Any questions from the floor? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank <laughs> <Please>. you. <laughs> thank you, Professor Park. Uh, you are a great commenter. Uh, regarding your first question, um, how can I say? Uh, there are many uh, criticism about EPS in the farming area, but little criticism until yet about this new program. So because this program is very new, that might be another reason, but we will see what happens uh, in your future. But your second comment or so question is about Boungun. That is, I, I totally agree with you. So if you read uh, my team's uh, report in, uh, written in 2018, there are many case stories there. Anyway, uh, what, is, what I want to uh, 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 tell you is the best case about the inviting marriage migrant sibling is if a marriage migrant husband, Korean farmer, invites uh, his wife's sibling 
is the best case. So they can manage their uh, work together very fantastically. So there are many uh, such cases in my uh, 19, no, no, 2018 uh, report. A uh, third question about uh, Joseonjok or Korean Chinese, that year, year 20, uh, 2021 is very special cases due to the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic. Some, uh, how can I say, uh, uh, we call H2, uh, visiting, uh, uh, how can I say, visiting Joseonjok, their period of uh, stay in Korea already expired, but they cannot return to China due to pandemic. So our government allow the Joseonjok or Korean Chinese, they can work in agriculture. So that is a very special situation. Uh, and the last question about uh, the, what is the situation in other Asia. I tried very hard, but I cannot find any uh, paper in English uh, about, uh, 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 how can I say, uh, foreign workers in agriculture in Japan or Taiwan. I cannot find any. I only find one or two short film about Taiwan case, but Taiwan case is very poor. Their foreign, situation, uh, foreign workers' situation in farm area, Taiwan, is very poor. Uh, yeah, so, but I will keep look at it. But one more. Uh, but uh, there are many papers regarding uh, this kind of seasonal migrant worker program in Western country, like Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and some other in Western country. There are many papers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, we invite third speakers, uh, Dr. Dong Yuna and Dr. Mi Hua Park. Okay. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about migrants and their participation in sports and physical activities and some constraints on foreign workers' participation during the COVID-19. Uh, this is a part of our research which show, which focus more on dual nature of constraints, which are not just uh, inhibiting, but also enabling in the pandemic context. Okay, before we go further, uh, allow me to introduce two authors, me, First, me, Dong Kyuna. I'm a research fellow at the Center for International Studies at Yinai University. Uh, I've been working for the institution since 2022 July. And the other author, Dr. Mia Park, she is a senior research fellow at the same institution. Even though she just started her career, career with the start of the K Academic Diffusion Research Center. She has been working over the last eight years with Director Lee. Okay, for in this presentation, uh, first uh, I start with uh, some constraints against the uh, foreign workers and particular to uh, constraints on foreign workers participation in sports during the pandemic. And next, I briefly explain uh, general and some constraints on E9 holders in South Korea. It is followed by a theoretical framework based on Foucault's understanding of power. Then I make study design in quick. Lastly, I present two inhibiting and four enabling constraints. As we all know, yeah, COVID-19 caused a, an unprecedented crisis to human beings we have never experienced before. Our schools and community centers shut down and most of these constraints prevent people from outdoor activities. So mostly use paper, social media, and research articles focus on negative aspects of constraints upon the actions of individuals. 
However, in this study, we wanted to show a little different understanding of constraints, which is not just the negative, but rather produce positive and productive practices that draw inhibiting and enabling action in the pandemic context. Okay, in literature, pandemic increased the constraints and most affected the minority groups in groups' participation in social and cultural programs. Only 40, according to UK's report, only 48% of Asian adults met the UK's recommendation for active living, which is lower than uh, the 60 percent of white British. Also, according to Canadian report, only 30, 35 percent of immigrant youth met the recommendation for active living, which is lower than the previous 56 percent of those in the pre-pandemic. People talk about uh, constraints in during the pandemic, first uh, we're going to look up. We're going to take a look at uh, some constraints on E9 visa holders in South Korea. E9 visa holders in South Korea refers to non-professional foreign workers in labor-intensive industries like farming, fishing, and manufacturing. Usually, they can work for three years, and they can extend the one year and 10 months is with the approval from the employer. And if, you, if they wanted to work more in Korea, they first have to back to their own country and apply again. If it, and if it is approved, then they must back to the previous employer. Also, they are not allowed to invite the spouse and their children. And literally, legally, they are allowed to change their workplace, but practically, it is really hard to change their workplace because they need approval from the employer. And for example, also particular to constraints to constraint on sports participation, uh, foreign workers' workplace is a little bit far from the center. I mean, foreign support center, usually located in suburb. And their priority is to get paid more and to get money rather than enjoying their life in Korea. So they usually want to work more, even during the weekend. And of course, they have also, they experience some financial issues and different sports cultures. Uh, if we look at the COVID-19 context, uh, foreign workers, uh, that during that time, foreign workers uh, mandatorily required to get tested for the infection of coronavirus, which will not apply to Korean citizens. We just, yeah, if I show symptoms, then we can get the test. So it is kind of a way to treat foreign workers as uh, suspected or confirmed cases of the infection. Because of that situation, foreign workers got easily lost their, their interest in involving in public place in South Korea. Also, foreign workers were the, tar the first target to be kicked out after the COVID happened. They were also, they were used they were grounded in dormitories and also online programs and platforms. Little provide in their native languages. And as you see, mostly focus on negative practice in the, the pandemic. But in this study, we wanted to show more positive aspects. We follow Foucault's understanding of power, which as a theoretical framework. Foucault says, uh, for Foucault's perspective, power is uh, relational and productive rather than relate to a negative 
repressive, and not violent. Think about constraints in sporting practice. Uh, when you enter the football pitch, you have to wear certain clothes, and you have to buy, you have to follow certain regulations, and you have to also uh, wear certain clothes and with gears. But I'm not sure it's only the feature of Korean, but we already happy before start when we buy some gears, clothes. Okay, to start some to start and play. To play tennis, I need that lucky. Then I can do better. So, such kind of constraints and regulations do not always produce negative things. Also, provide the practice that enable for people to to kind of encourage to do more. So, following Foucault, Deborah Shogun says the power has constraints on action that are both inhibiting and enabling. For this study, we interviewed 10 foreign workers, from five from the Hwasong Immigrant Community Service Center, the other five from Gimpo Foreign Resident Support Center. Gyeonggi-do province has the most population of foreign workers, and Hwasong City and Gimpo City are top two cities of Gyeonggi province, so that's why we chose the two immigrant, two foreign centers. Okay, this is the demography of participants. We use the pseudonym for the participants, but age, country, center, sports are real, real ones. Okay, for the research, uh, the inhibiting constraints, one inhibiting constraints, as we know, the COVID-19 caused the nationwide and global-wide restriction of outdoor activities, which completely prevented foreign workers from participation. And according to participants, uh, foreign worker participants, they really uncomfortable whenever they enter the field play to play. They keep wearing masks and then bring vaccinate vaccine certificate on hand, and then every time they have to get body check. So this must be a constraint to inhibit foreign workers' participation in sports. The other one is um, foreign workers usually ask to not to get corona, because if you get the corona, you negatively affect others other fellows, and then the whole factories. It is not just to apply to foreign workers. It is common discourse. Like, uh, we cannot get the corona. If you get the corona, you made ours, others' life ruin. So, so under the such circumstance, uh, foreign workers control their, themselves and control not to go out. We, so it makes me feel, it makes me come up with the focus technology of the, uh, domination, which determine the conduct of individuals and place them to a certain ends of domination. Okay, uh, let's move on to the enabling constraints. Uh, because constraint, because COVID caused uh, many restrictions and we have to come up with a new and alternative way to participate in activities by online. And this may in contribute to en enhancing the knowledge and the perfection of skills and techniques through self-practice. However, all participants in this study recognize the importance of in-person sports part participation, which should not be replaced by online. This shows that uh, uh, such constraints uh, enable foreign workers to recognize the important importance of normality, which makes kind of enable to, uh, importance, which make uh, foreign workers to play with friends in person 
uh, any time. And also, um, there are some cases uh, because of the lack of members for foreign workers team and hard to find uh, engaged in sports and physical activity like a team sports football, they had to join Korean sports club. Ironically, such constraints enable foreign workers to get to know Korean society, Korean language, and Korean sports culture more, like uh, sharing Korean food with Korean people and foreign workers, and they try to use Korean words uh, in the games, and then also they can learn some skills from Korean players. In return, it is also opportunity for Korean people to get to know foreign workers from different countries. And is the, the third constraint is kind of can be seen the way that foreign workers were transformed to more active subjects. Because um, let's think about some benefits of foreign workers involved in foreign support center. Like uh, they, do not, they did not need to pay tuition, uh, pay membership fees and then use of equipment facilities for free and foreign workers more focused uh, program schedules. But after the corona happened, all disappeared. So to continue their respective sports, they showed some uh, affirmative actions like by joining Korean clubs and paying membership fees. So it can be shown that yeah, they were transformed to more subject, active subject of sports participation in the pandemic context. Okay, lastly, um, when we, when during the interview, we identified the researchers' understanding of power as a productive, relational, and relevant questions also enabled the foreign workers to reflect on their choice, why they had to be these sports, not other sports, why they do not want to enjoy online. First, they say, yeah, uh, we're just uh, not interested. I just wanted to do that. But if after we keep asking, asking more too deeply, and they, oh, maybe I do not want to get injured from the contact, physical contact sports. And they wanted to get master's certificate to teach their country people in when they back to their home country. Okay, to wrap up, uh, I want to say uh, this study is kind of effort to look at the positive outcomes from the constraints of the pandemic by in, in empirically engaging how human beings were willing to understand, transform, and adjust ourselves. So it is reminiscent of uh, uh, Cooper's in the film Interstellar saying, we human beings will find a way as we will do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. No. And the Professor Lee, please. Aloha, my name is Harry Ann Lee and I'm a professor of communicology at the School of Communication and Information. Um, I'd like to thank the two authors for a very, very interesting um, paper. I don't have to repeat the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic has significantly affected all our lives, many of them negative. In particular, one of the very negative consequences of the COVID pandemic is that it has intensified the disparity. It has intensified the existing health disparities. It has intensified the economic disparity. Also, even things like a housing disparity, depending on where you lived. Uh, if you lived in a substandard housing, that very crowded quarters, that it has significantly negative impact. So um, it really has worsened a lot of the a lot of the disparities across the board. And so in that negative context, it is quite interesting to see the authors decided to take a quite different approach to see what are some of the um, positive or enabling characteristics that came out of the pandemic. Um, and given that they're 
participants that they are focusing on or immigrant workers in South Korea, as we have been hearing about this, their life there is not very um, easy. So uh, using sports as a context to really um, understand what are some of the potential positive outcomes that can come out um, to improve their lives in general, I really welcomed this perspective. And so I'm not going to talk about the um, constraining uh, or the inhibit inhibiting constraints, but I want to focus on their second enabling constraint uh, that really made me feel um, very happy and heartwarming. Uh, the fact that because they could not really play with a lot of their existing, um, you know, friends that are of same ethnic background, I guess they decided to now go reach out and play with uh, Korean players. And that had uh, surprising and very positive outcomes. So um, it's, uh, it's kind of nice to see that how that might have really impacted their attitude towards Koreans uh, and Korean society and how they felt towards them and that they start to recognize that, well, you know, it's, um, they're not always nasty, mean, discriminatory people. Sometimes we can come together and uh, play together and appreciate each other. So that is a very important um, awareness or, you know, um, realization that you cannot really teach them by telling them, you know, you should think about this. So it is very interesting that that kind of um, experience was possible because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and also, um, I'd like to point out that sports is a very uh, important sort of topic in terms of um, helping people to achieve uh, well-being. So you're, you know, engaging in physical activity and that strengthens your physical, um, you know, parts of your body, but it also often has a lot of positive impact. How you perceive yourself, how you uh, have self-esteem and self-efficacy. And through sports, you also um, can learn how to become a dynamic person, you become your own, sort of develop self of autonomy to be able to influence your destiny yourself. So uh, while the authors were talking about a follow-up study um, with additional ethnographical uh, research, but as someone who's trained in quantitative science, I had a slightly different opinion, which is uh, to take this to a uh, much wider scale. So now that you have this um, extensive ethnographic research, I think it would be good if you can develop it into some sort of a survey or um, interview where you actually um, involve a significant number of participants and get their responses and get their attitude and behaviors. And I think you can probably use the data to demonstrate a need for uh, programs that are directed at this um, folks. So maybe use it as an opportunity to maybe come up with a community-based um, participatory research programs where you can create more opportunities where people can get mixed it together in a sports uh, context between immigrants and Koreans, and then um, also help them to reach what you refer to as ethical um, subjects, where you become really uh, a master of your own destiny. And um, perhaps once they engage in this kind of way of thinking and achieve the critical awareness, then maybe it would be um, possible for you to even harness uh, those capacity into engaging them more into uh, advocacy efforts to involve them in changing policies and uh, support structure and infrastructure um, that it's necessary for them to have a better uh, more happier lives in South Korea. So I will stop there. Thank you very much again. Okay, first I would like to thank you for your 
great and valuable feedback from yeah, my lower level. Not finish the research paper because yeah, I'm really sorry to give you kind of uh, some. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I sent you a week, a month ago uh, without proofreading, so I can show later more developed version. And I fully accept what you said, and then I also recognize the importance of conducting ethnographic research and participatory research. But this is, I told you, it is a kind of part of our research project. And we have also, we will conduct the survey as well. First, uh, I, we already translated English, our survey, English, Korean, and plan to translate Cambodia, Vietnamese, and Mongolia, well, like that. So maybe after that, also at the or at the same time, we will also involve, engage the community, the foreign workers community. Then I think I believe, as you say, yeah, we can come up with and find the ethnic ethical subject, which is shown in which means in the masterpiece of focus. Subject technology of the subject. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, studies on migration is a rather new field in Korea, but growing rapidly uh, during the last decade. Uh, when I had a presentation here in the Center for Korean Studies almost 10 years ago, I remember the audience uh, did not understand the basic system of uh, Korean immigration, uh, including visa systems and the issues of migration, uh, such as Korean Chinese, like that. But now, today, uh, you know, specific topics are reported uh, from the governing system between central and local governments and the agricultural sector, uh, and even sports-related uh, questions. Uh, because of the time limit, I pushed you not to ask questions, uh, but I hope uh, you expand your questions in the breaking time. Now I'm closing the first panel. panel uh, thank you very much. Uh, only 10 minutes passed. Thank you. Thank you very much. So our second panel will begin at 3.50 sharp. Thank you very much. Now we will begin our second panel that is focused on Korea and identity politics. Again, uh, I'm Tae Yong Baek, the director of the Center for Korean Studies. Today is, we have uh, three speakers. And first uh, presentation is titled Analysis of Improvement uh, Direction of a uh, Hangul Education for Koreans with a Foreign Nationality Residing in Korea. And our speaker is Professor uh, Song Donggi Song, and he has gotten his PhD from Uzbekistan University, and he studied at Korea University, and he's currently uh, from Inner University Frontier uh, College of Frontier Studies. Yeah, and so uh, after Professor Song's presentation, Professor Barry Kim from East Asian Language and Literature at William, uh, University of, of Hawaii, Manoa, will be uh, also giving uh, discussions. So first, uh, let's warmly welcome Professor Song. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <laughs> I'm so happy now. Why? <laughs> For the first time in my life, I came to the American territory, especially Hawaii. <laughs> Do you know uh, why I came to for the first time in American territory? Reason? Do you know? <laughs> uh, when I uh, had the time to select, uh, select uh, university and department. Uh, you know my AZ right now. <laughs> my teacher called me, uh, I recommend you good university and good department. What? 
He said, the Department of Russian Language and Russian Literature in the age of Cold War. <laughs> I don't, I didn't want <laughs> to. No, my father, my teacher pushed me in this department. After that, every day I think, I thought, when I will be in America? <laughs> no. In this year, I came to Hawaii for the first time in my life. Uh, Professor Beck uh, explained earlier, uh, I uh, graduated from uh, the Academic Science of Uzbekistan. Uh, I acquired a PhD, a, a, are you surprised, uh, in Uzbek language and Russian language. Uh, I'm a first person, Korean first person, First Korean person who uh, wrote dissertation in Uzbek and Russian. Wow. <laughs> so uh, my English is not good. Uh, uh, yesterday, uh, uh, Idoki Sanzengnim uh, uh, explained the history of Korean immigration over Hawaii and uh, showed the historical sites. I was deeply impressed by seeing and hearing uh, the migration or uh, immigration history of uh, great Koreans in Hawaii. Now I would like to tell you about the Korean diaspora of uh, Russia CIS, in Korean language, Korea In or Korea Saram. Mm. Now I will uh, refer to uh, the Korean diaspora of uh, Russia CIS at the long world. So in Korean language, Korea in, uh, as Korea in. Uh, the immigration history of uh, Korea in is also great. However, they are in a very difficult situation uh, from the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union in 1991 uh, to the present. Uh, so I read uh, my presentation uh, shortly. Uh, in uh, 1937, uh, Korean suffered the first post uh, migration from uh, maritime province to Central Asia. The first generation of first uh, migrants uh, raided the groundwork for settlement while working in collective farms. And the second generation of them uh, completed a higher education and engaged in a number of professional jobs based on the high academic zeal unique to the Korean people. This was possible thanks to the uh, social system of the Soviet Union at, at, at the time. At the time, the Soviet government provided free education to all people of the Soviet Union. By using this system, the uh, Korean community was able to uh, successfully settle down well while being recognized as a professional in the country of residence in Soviet Union. However, in the background of such a successful settlement, they had to, they had to endure the pain of forgetting their mother tongue. At school, at work, and, over, uh, and in order to join the community part, uh, Korean first on Russian language. And over, that, over time, they forgot the Korean language and uh, did not teach their uh, descendants Korean language. Uh, as you know, Joseph Stalin, uh, the language law in 1938, which required all Soviet citizens to speak only Russian. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, a Korean who had no choice but to abandon their Korean language in order to successfully settle down in the Soviet Union faced the following new problem. First, the emergence of nationalism among the indigenous people of the country of residence in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan where many uh, Koreans 
uh, reside. Nationalism is centered on the indigenous Uzbek, Kazakh, and Kyrgyz began to emerge after uh, independence. In this process, the status of ethnic minorities such as Koreans has changed from the past. Indigenous people, peoples were also treated as minorities under the Soviet system. So there was a little sense of uh, deprivation experienced by ethnic minorities such as uh, uh, Koreans. Rather than uh, later, uh, they believed that uh, uh, Korea was uh, superior in all respects to the indigenous peoples. In fact, based on the uh, recognition, minorities were able to work without restriction, restrictions in all field. However, after independence, indigenous peoples emerged uh, as the mainstream of the country where they reside, resided. And the minorities such as uh, Koreans suffered a social discrimination. Second, stipulation of the official language of the native language of the country of residence. As the government of Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan uh, stipulated the indigenous language as an official language in their constitutions after independence. Ethnic minorities such as Korean were uh, socially discriminated against if they could not speak languages such as Uzbek, Kazakh, and Kyrgyz. Unlike in this past, there were no problems with schoolwork, employment, and promotion if only Russian was spoken. But after independence, if, you, if minority do not, does not know the native language of the country, a minority will face the disadvantage. Third, destroying the formal uh, formality of high education and the professionalism. The ethnic situation uh, deteriorated as the resident country uh, converted its economic system to capitalism along the nationalism uh, centered on the indigenous people of the resident country. In particular, uh, Korean society, which had many professional workers, uh, suffered great economically as government support uh, virtually uh, disappeared. Free education and the free medical care, which existed under the Soviet regime in the past, virtually collapsed after independence. And the wages and the treatment of those who worked in this field rapidly deteriorated. Therefore, since most professional Koreans received low wages from their existing jobs, they either changed the jobs or attempted side jobs that guaranteed high returns. In the case of the former, it was generally business, but most of them were familiar with capitalism, so there were more failures than successes. In the case of the latter, they neglected their children's education due to lack of time while working a side job. For this reason, uh, the uh, Korean society gradually lost its high educational zeal to be become a professional as in the past. Through the above historical process, the rest of place Korean choose was their motherland, motherland Korea. However, the uh, Korean language problem uh, came as uh, difficult in their stay in Korea. And even if they wanted to learn Korean, a Korean language education system suitable for them was not established. And because of this, the closeness life of a Korean made it more difficult to learn Korean. Korean can be an important uh, human resources in Korea in order to solve the uh, population problem in Korea. Well, the situation of low birth rate and uh, population aging is getting worse. Therefore, it, it is judged that uh, Korean government should improve uh, Korean language education for 
Korean so that they can adapt, adapt and live in Korean, Korea well. Thank you so much. Please take a seat. Thank you very much. Our discussant, Professor Mary Kim, will be speaking. Yeah. Um, uh, my name is Mary Kim, the East Asian Languages. <laughs> thank you. East Asian Languages and Literature uh, Department. Uh, thank you very much for the informative presentation, Dr. Song. I learned a lot through your paper and also. Uh, I think it was very important that you raise our awareness of this important matter. Um, so your paper provides a very nice overview of the challenges of the return migrants from Russia CIS residing in Korea currently face, especially focusing on Korean language education. And I thought it was very interesting to learn that one of the key factors that uh, drove the uh, migrant back to Korea also had to do with language. So as you explain in very detail in your paper, in contrast to Soviet Union era, where everyone only spoke uh, Russian, uh, since the establishment of CIS in 1991, uh, CIS member states such as Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan decided to adopt their indigenous language as an official language. And therefore, uh, ethnic minorities such as Koreans who only speak uh, Russian uh, were uh, getting uh, discrimination socially and economically. So because of this uh, language policy changes and of course the instability in the regions, they decided to come back to Korea. And they still struggle in Korea as well because of language. So it kind of shows this recycle uh, relationship because how much their livelihood is affected by language. And, um, and you point out that uh, one of the reasons that they are having problem with acquiring Korean language is uh, because the existing Korean language programs run by NGOs and the general school system in the local community do not take these learners' specific background and needs into consideration. And I thought this was very ironic because, as you mentioned in your paper, South Korean government has been very actively uh, promoting Korean language abroad. Uh, even in the CIS. Uh, so I looked up the Sejong Haktang website, and there are eight Sejong Haktang alone in Uzbekistan, and then five in Kyrgyzstan, and maybe I think it was three in Kazakhstan. But how much have they really invested helping migrants residing in Korea to acquire Korean language and culture? And according to your presentation, it seems like not much, or at least not enough for them. Um, and then uh, I also thought that improving their Korean language program is also uh, very important. But in the long run, it would be important to have a long-term goal, such as creating a more equitable educational system to include and integrate these migrant or immigrant children so that they become not only a competent Korean speaker, but they become a competent member of the society and the community and at the same time, utilizing their Russian CIS language background. So looking at uh, US examples, I thought maybe something like a dual language program could be an option. Uh, I remember you mentioned in your paper, there's an elementary school in Ansan called Sonny, or Sonny, yes. And 80% of the student population come from this migrant family. So you mentioned that it's not an ideal environment to acquire Korean language alone. It is true. But on the other side, it could be a very optimal environment where dual language program can be implemented. So the children can learn academic materials in both languages in Korean and their native language, such as uh, Russian. And uh, looking at US, which is like a multicultural and multi-ethnic immigrant society, we see a lot of language level, language programs at different levels. So like dual language program are usually implemented in early childhood education, but also up to the college level. And that's what we have at UH called uh, the Korean language uh, flagship program. So you empower the, the learners, not just learning uh, the language, but the learn 
that through the language, through their bilingual or multilingual uh, background, empowers them to become a competent uh, member in the society and in the global uh, society. Uh, and then, uh, as the uh, so th these are things I thought maybe could be uh, implemented in part of Korea's long-term goals, as we learned in earlier uh, presentation that Korea is becoming more and more a uh, multicultural society. Uh, but I don't see yet Korean as a multilingual society, and I think studies have been showing that actually multiculturalism cannot be sustained without really embracing multilingualism, uh, which is an essential embedded nature of uh, the multiculturalism. Uh, and then going back to your paper, uh, after reading it, I have a couple of questions. And uh, first was, uh, maybe it's kind of related to what Professor Ned Schultz asked earlier, but I was wondering is what the return migrants from Russia CIS are experiencing unique to the group, or do disparities exist among different migrant groups within uh, foreign nationals living in Korea? And then I also wondered how the return migrants from Russia CIS and their children and how others view their identities. I think it was also briefly mentioned that their sense of identity were probably very different than Joseonjok. Yes. And my third question was, I noticed that you do mention that there are not much support, but I was wondering still if there are any existing local government policy or programs for these foreign nationals uh, living in Korea, especially in Incheon and Ansan area, to assist with their language or workforce training. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kim. Wonderful comment. <clears throat> I think uh, this is a very interesting story, actually. People who have lived in uh, part of Soviet as a uh, feeling themselves as a uh, Russian, speaking Russian language. At some point, they were suddenly said, you're not Russian, you, uh, your language, uh, Russian is not your own language. And they started to learn Korean. And uh, uh, in Korea, still, uh, the education of Korean language system uh, is not you know, fully functional in many sense. So this presentation really uh, raises a lot of interesting questions, I think. Especially, uh, Professor Song mentioned uh, uh, the Korea in or Korea Saram as a uh, designation of this group of people. And I'm not sure whether it really refers to the identity of their people. As uh, Professor Kim mentioned, what kind of identity are they developing? Are they feeling distinctly Uzbekistan? <laughs> Or are they now Korea Saram? And what about their relationship with South Korea and North Korea? So those are raising a very interesting question, I think. So among the audience, do you have any other question that uh, we can combine with this comment? If none, Professor Song, please. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for a wonderful uh, comment. Uh, I tried to uh, answer successfully. Uh, the Chinese government uh, has given minorities autonomy. This is different. Uh, Stalin uh, uh, language law, language law, uh, Soviet citizens had to speak in Russian officially. No, uh, Chinese government uh, allow uh, Chinese citizen and minorities uh, to use uh, uh, nation, uh, national language, Joseonjok, um, to use Korean language. Therefore, Chinese, uh, Korean Chinese can come to Korea and work immediately in Korean. They know they can speak. Korean. So immediately they can work in Korea. Especially Korean citizens do not know Korean. Who, who is Korean? 
and do not know Russian language. Therefore, it's basically difficult to communicate with each other. Uh, maybe uh, in Korea, in restaurant, in cafe, uh, 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 <laughs> so many work. No, we can uh, communicate each other. No, Korean uh, cannot work in restaurant, cafe, because they cannot speak English or Rus uh, Korean very well. No Korean citizens basically learn English. Uh, uh, middle school, high school, university. Therefore, most teachers who majored in Korean language education can teach a Korean while using English. However, few Koreans can teach Korean, Korean foreigner while Korean while speaking Russian. Do you know Russian language? This language is the most difficult in the world. <laughs> I entered into uh, the Department of Russian Language and Literature in 1988. No, but I not fluent. It's so difficult. Uzbek language is Altaic language. I uh, so I uh, acquired a PhD in Uzbek language. Russian language is so terrible. <laughs> uh, therefore, uh, Koreans are in the environment where it is difficult to learn Korean uh, property in Korea because Koreans do not speak Korean well. Some uh, Korean Chinese commit scams. <laughs> uh, Korean Chinese, uh, not some, some, some Korean uh, Korean Chinese uh, commit scams. Uh, so the relationship between uh, Korean and Joseon Jok is not good. I was surprised. Uh, when I uh, uh, con conducted an uh, online uh, survey. Korean uh, hate Joseonjo. All of Korean asked, uh, answered. So I think it's uh, good to use a Korean teacher who majored in Korean language education. They can uh, properly uh, teach uh, Korean language to Korean in Russian language. Uh, fortunately, unfortunately, many uh, Korean who majored in Korean language education live in Korea. Unfortunately, however, the Korean government is unaware of the fact. For Koreans, Russia is uh, 10 times more difficult than English. Uh, so, uh, uh, next, uh, uh, according to my survey result, Korean living in Korea are in a good economic situation. Uh, Koreans who have worked in Korea for more than five years uh, move from a one room to uh, two room, one room and two room unit, and uh, also buy a car. Longer depends on out, uh, outdated policies of the Korean government and the NGO. If a Korean uh, needs work, job. It is found through the Korean network.
Korean now want to coexist with Koreans and want their children to adapt well in Korean society. However, the Korean government and NGO still insist on outdated policies and systems. Korean don't want money. Korean don't want charity. Korean want good policy and system. <laughs> Uh, Korea is uh, facing a serious national problem of low uh, fertility and population aging. I think Korean and uh, Joseonjok are good human resources that can solve this problem. From this point of view, the Korean government and NGO will have to establish and uh, promote policies that are suitable and realistic for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Song. Very, very insightful comment and answer. Our next speaker is Professor Mina Yang, and she will be presenting uh, on uh, Soviet Korean identity, presenting Soviet uh, Korean identity in multicultural society, activities of uh, ensemble Chongchun in Uzbekistan during 1972 to 1980s. Uh, Professor Yang. Uh, is currently uh, a professor at Chungang University, but she has also gotten her PhD uh, in sociology from St. Petersburg uh, National University. And uh, uh, she is a, uh, has a, a published extensively, including uh, some uh, sports and other dance-related uh, articles. So please uh, give a big applause to Professor Yang. Welcoming her. Aloha. Good afternoon. It's great to see many distinguished individuals present and share my historical research work. My name is Mina Yang from Institute for Historical Studies, Chungang University. My presentation will focus on Soviet Korean performing arts activities in Uzbekistan during the 1970s and 80s, most notably the activities of Hwang Man Gum's Korhos, Politajes Ansangul Chongchun means youth. To understand how Koreans express their identity within a multicultural society during the Soviet period, I have diachronically traced the cultural lives of Russian Koreans, primarily through dance, music, and other cultural activities. My research is in its early stages. Any comments? at this stage would therefore be invaluable as I develop my work and research further. Much of the body of work in this field has focused on the Korean theater in Armata, Kazakhstan. Its 90th anniversary in 2022, last year, highlighted its importance in transnational Korean history and culture. Uzbek Korean and Kazakh Korean cultural connections have been largely neglected in existing historiography. But their contribution to Soviet Korean culture is unmistakably important. How do you do that? Oh, got it. Thank you. This is contents today's my presentation. Before we begin, briefly, I would like to tell you about the Koreans' migration process to Russia. Most scholars and specialists in Korean-Russian history agree to divide it into four steps of Koreans' migration process to Russia. Let's take a look one by one. The first step is voluntary migration. After the 1860 Convention of Peking, the borders of Joseon Dynasty Korea and the 
Russian empires were connected, allowing for cross-border migration from Russia, uh, from Korea into Russia, primarily due to famine and weather conditions. The second step is political emigration, the Japanese occupation of the Korean Peninsula after the 1905 Russo-Japanese War forced many of the intelligentsia to leave for Russia, later enforced by the 1910 Korean-Japanese Annexation Treaty. The third step is deportation, in other words, forced migration in 1937. The Soviet Koreans were forced to relocate to Central Asia. The fourth step is voluntary migration. After the collapse of Soviet Union, most Korean Russians left for Russia's megapolis, like Moscow and St. Petersburg, etc., to study or get a job and amongst other reasons. Or others returned to the maritime province in the Far East. Now approximately 500,000 Korean Russians in CSI countries are living. Between August 21st and September 28th, 1937, more than 170,000 Koreans were forcibly relocated to Central Asia, most to Tashkent, where they began forming colhoses along the Chirchik River. As you can see on the map, this is where the river Chirchik flows. During the 1950s and 60s, the most famous Korean colhoses are the colhose North Star, Balyarnais Vesta, Kim Byung-hwa Korhos, Hwang Mangum's Balitajel, and Korhos Pravda. In upper district, uh, Chirichik district, Tashkent region. The Korean Korhos is operated as small cities with schools, hospitals, and libraries, along with other facilities. The Korean Korhosniks became the richest in Uzbekistan. The Balitajel was one of the most prominent. As you will find out, Hwang Mangum was the one of the key figures who contributed to the development of Korean cultural activities in Uzbekistan. The Korean co-host Balitajer was built in 1925 in the upper Chirchik district of Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Balitajer is a Soviet neologism and is an abbrevi abbreviation for the political department Balitajer, which existed from 1936 three to 35 in charge of automobiles and tractors. In 1953, Hwang Mangum was appointed as the chairman of Balitajel, which was experiencing financial challenges. In 1957, Hwang was named a socialist labor hero after the pro profitability of the co-host increased by approximately 30%. And Balitajel earned a reputation throughout the Soviet Union as a millionaire co-host. Huang operated the site for 32 years. With these accomplishments under his belt, he could then enter the political area. This is a photo. Here are the chairmen of Korean co-hosts in Uzbekistan. From the left side, Huang Mangum from Balitajel. Next, Kim Byung-hwa, and third one, third person, Che Sergei from the Northern Lighthouse, Severny Mayak. The last person, Kim Dmitri, Sverdlov Korhos. I will show you one short video clip on the cultural life in Korhos Palitajel in the late 1960s. The narration is in Russian. Unfortunately, there are no subtitles. The Huang invested 2.5 million rubles annually into many cultural and industrial facilities. Namely, firstly, eight schools for 4,000 students, secondly, a first-level national theater, the thirdly, a 23,000 sport complex, and finally, a 120-bed hospital, five clinics, pharmacies, and daycare facilities. In addition to this, FC Palitajer finished 
a third in the 1966 Soviet Championship Division II and Class A, and the women's field hockey team won silver medal in the 1989 Sports Championship. Not only was the Polita just a powerful sporting community, but became a must-visit tourist hotspot. Now it's time to turn to take a look at the cultural life in Kurhos Polita Jail in the 1960s. Улицы освещались фонарями, были заасфальтированы, имелся фонтан. Колхозники получали в среднем 300 рублей в месяц. Для сравнения, это была зарплата руководителей района или профессора. Не забывал председатель о культурной жизни и принадлежности к этносу. Так был создан известный народный ансамбль «Чен Чун». Мария поет о любви, о воздушных корабликах. She sang a penure. Он лично интересовался делами в ансамбле. Благодаря такой поистине отеческой заботе, ансамбль в 1977 году был удостоен премии комсомола Узбекистана, а еще через два года премии всесоюзного комсомола. При колхозе кипела спортивная жизнь. Футбольная команда выступала в союзных лигах. Не случайно именно политотдел был выбран для показа многочисленным иностранным делегациям, приезжавшим в СССР. Улицы... Huang considered the cultural and sporting education as a vital for all Kurhoznik's and recruited specialists in the performing arts to aid this. Inviting Uzbekistani married artist Hwang jong -ok, who graduated from the Choi Seung hee National Dance School in Pyongyang, North Korea. She alongside this actively supported the cultural activities of the Chongchun Ensemble. Korean performing arts activities in Uzbekistan Due to the forced migration, Korean artists were scattered across the Gujar Urda in Kazakhstan and Gurulen and Tashkent in Uzbekistan. Despite the tough circumstances, performances from Korean artists continued and were very active within most of the Korean courthouses, mostly in an amateur fashion. There were two Korean theaters in Uzbekistan, the first Horezum State Korean Theater and the second Tashkent Music Drama Korean Theater. The Horezum State Korean Theater was established in Gurulen City on November 3rd in 1937 and merged with the Tashkent Music Drama Korean Theater in 1942. The Tashkent Music Drama Theater Korean Theater was founded in September 1939 and closed in summer 1950. Both traditional such as Chunyangjeon, Simcheongjeon, Hungbujeon, and modern Korean, Soviet, and Uzbek plays were performed. And Korean cultural activities contributed significantly to the amateur groups of Tashkent. For all the actors, there were many cultural experiences to be had from music to dance alongside plays. They became a central pillar of the rural enlightenment movement and were used during holidays, festivals, and propaganda campaigns. They were immensely popular amongst Koreans in other parts. Lee Kyung-hee particularly was recognized as a married artist in the field of estrada in Uzbekistan, suggesting a professional level to Korean cultural activities. In 1950, the Tashkent Theater was merged with the Tashkent Korean Theater, causing several designations or returns to Sahalin Korean Theater. And others joined the Kazakhstan Korean Theater. There are artists of Korean Korean Theater in 1938. Korean Music and Dance Group. During the 1950s, Korean cultural classes opened in the Ostrovsky Theater Art Institute, and Korean professional artists began to be trained in Uzbekistan. Performance quality greatly improved, 
and many artists from the Institute were in the Kazakhstan Korean theater. The 1960s saw the sowing of Soviet culture and the rise of Western rock music within youth subcultures. The combination of this rock music with domestic bird music formed a unique Soviet rock sound. Due to the influence of this new form, amateur band activities developed in the Tashkent Korean courthouses, with 10 being formed in the 1960s. This would form the basis for the creation of professional ensembles post-1960s, including Ensemble Kayagum and Cheongchun. Ensemble Kayagum. July 9, 1969, would see the first uh, formation of the first ensemble who played the Kore Korean traditional instruments called the Kayagum. Composer Park Young-jin was artistic director at Kim Byung-hwa's North Star Chorus and introduced authentic Korean music and dance to Uzbekistan. In February 1970, Kayagum entered a contest in Moscow for Lenin's 100th birthday celebration, meeting 18 other teams. The essence, North Korean dance was showcased by choreographer Hwang jong ok The ensemble would be merged with Cheongchun in 1984. Ensemble Cheongchun was formed later than other Kerhose ensembles, playing music since the late 60s, but officially began as a four-member band in 1971. The name derives from the youth of the members aged between 12 and 22. The leader was Hwang Yevgeny. He was Hwang Mangum's third son. In 1972, Cheongchun participated in a Uzbekistan regional competition of young voices, Maladie Galassa, in which the 10 most popular singing stars in the Soviet Union competed against each other. They went in the final round and were invited to various events, greatly increasing visibility and popularity within the Soviet Union. Their 1973 debut performance was met with huge audiences. In 1967, Dance Company was formed when the new artistic director and composer Jin Piotr, a graduate of the Ostrovsky Theater Art Institute, joined Cheongchun. Through the use of traditional choreography and costumes, Hwang jong ok sensationalized her audiences. In 1977 and 79, they would win the Lenin Gamsamol Award in Uzbekistan and the USSR, respectively, drawing on a huge repertoire of popular Soviet songs, traditional Korean North and South Korean pop song, and traditional Korean dance, all of which demonstrated on Soviet Korean identity. They would come to release multiple albums and tour with major global stars. Hwang Yevgeny noted that its popularity was so widespread in 1970s that it was called Cheongchun phenomenon or Cheongchun fever. Hwang jong ok worked at the Kazakhstan Korean Theater and Cheongchun in Uzbekistan. Her influence allowed a unique form of North Korean dance to develop in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Information on, on her in scarce, and there isn't even a consensus on how her name was spelled, Hwang jong ok versus Hwang jong ok According to Gimbert's Who is Who, she was born in 1940 and worked for North Korean National Dance Company, having graduated from the Chesing He National Dance School in Pyongyang. After this, she moved to Soviet Union and graduated from Tashkent School of Dance and the Moscow Theater School. She was also active in the Uzbek National Dance Company Bakhor, being awarded as a merit artist in Uzbekistan in 1974. Margarita Han, the artistic director of the Korean dance company Korea, who are currently performing in Uzbekistan, places great significance of, of Hwang jong -ok's role in introducing North Korean dance to Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Conclusion. The Soviet regime initially used performing arts as a new way to propagandize the Soviet society, including Soviet Koreans. 
particularly as Soviet Korea had been forced to relocate to Central Asia under suspicion of Japanese espionage, dance and performing arts played an active role in this agenda. The economic strength of the Karhoses gives a sense of support for these cultural activities, and the 70s and 80s would see flourishing growth in Uzbek Korean ensembles. Hwang Mangum's ensemble Cheongchun particularly gained nationwide popularity, and their work came to represent Korean living in Soviet Union, giving them a visual identity. These cultural activities served as an effective means of visualizing the success of Korean core host and establishing a positive image for Koreans. Additionally, they would garner popularity across the 200 ethnic groups within the Soviet Union, contributing significantly to the cultural development of Korean Uzbeks. In all of this, Hwang jong -ok was the most vital person. Svetlana Voim's concept of utopian nostalgia, encompassing visualization, restoration, and totalization of the house that no longer exists, relates to this greatly. Korean dance and music represent a uh, nostalgia for a homeland, visualizing a strong identity for those Soviet Koreans in multicultural societies. I have also emphasized the transnational connections between Kazakhstani and Uzbekistan in performing arts. However, the cultural activities of Uzbek Koreans in the Korhosis declined mainly due to economic hardship in the 1980s, and finally with the collapse of Soviet Union in 1990. I hope that in the future, a more detailed and full picture, full picture of the life of Hwang jong -ok can be formed through further work in this field. This has been largely neglected by scholarship to date, and my research will begin the process of addressing this. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, we have a discussion, Professor Harrison Kim. Please. Can I close this, Yejun? Okay. Yes, um, I'm Harrison Kim from the History Department. Thank you so very much, um, Professor Young, for this wonderful, intriguing paper. I learned so much um, from this uh, from this paper. Um, the Soviet Koreans or Koryos Haram, they have been the subject of excellent research recently with books like John Chang's Burnt by the Sun and Alisa Park's um, Sovereignty Experiments. Um, but I think Professor Young's study is uh, rather unique because it focuses on musical ensembles. Um, and, um, you know, this is one of the first studies that I've seen on, on this particular topic. Um, I imagine the areas along Cherchik River near Tashkent in Uzbekistan to be picturesque and peaceful. But of course, the history of the Soviet Koreans is far from anything but peaceful and picturesque. The Korean migrant radicals and revolutionaries of the first half of the 20th century, they did not fare well most of them going through tragic experiences of war and persecution. All of us here who call Hawaii home, um, we have our own story. Um, and we know the, the story of Alice Hyun and the Hyun family very well. Um, the persecution of Soviet Koreans was driven by suspicion and false allegations, often from the Soviet leadership's orientalist, racist, and very rigid perception of the Korean ethnicity. So this is one argument made by John Chang. So even when Soviet Koreans were a diverse group, living and working in various regions and sectors, the forced relocation of Koreans to Central Asia in 1937, this was clearly an authoritarian transgression that has not been properly examined in terms of justice 
and human rights. But how well the Soviet Koreans adapted and prospered in these regions is remarkable. A history with tragic origins that testifies to the resilience of a community. So reading your paper was uh, truly wonderful, Professor Yang. So I've got some questions, and they are also commentary as well. Um, my first question, your paper shows the complexity of the practice of propaganda. I got to say, everything originating from the government for the public has a propagandistic side. But when an artistic production is genuine and beloved by the public, is there a dimension in which art can never be fully subordinated by propaganda? Isn't art always greater than any propagandistic agenda? The history of Politotol and other Korean musical ensembles in Central Asia indicate this feature. Um, my... Um, my second feature, my, my second question has to do with Chungchun fever in the Soviet Union. This is a fascinating um, historical moment. So your paper points out that global Korean cultural transmission has another large region that we have not really recognized fully in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. So this is a kind of Hallyu in the former Soviet territory. Um, but at the same time, I wonder if this kind of ethnic cultural transmission um, was or the ethnic or the race, the, the importance of race was not as important in the spread and enjoyment of Korean culture during this period in this region. So the, the Soviet culture was um, very uh, adamant to recognize that there is no racial hierarchy whatsoever. But at the same time, we know that that is in reality was not true. So I'm wondering how much race played in this um, spread of Korean culture. Um, and my third question is generally about the, um, the Korean co cohorts themselves. How big was the Politoto? How many Koreans lived and worked in such a farm. It must have been thousands, maybe tens of thousands. Were the Koreans the only ethnic group in a Korean cohorts? It's, it's such a fascinating story with, with their own musical troops and sports teams. I would like to learn more. Oh, my fourth question. I was very surprised to learn in your, from your paper that there was a theater production called Hong Bam Do in the 1940s. Named after, of course, the famed revolutionary uh, who led the Battle of Pongodong in 1920 in Manchuria. So is this right? Were Soviet Koreans already celebrating the life of Hong Bam Do in the 1940s? This is a fascinating um, development. This is a, toward the end of his life, of course, Hong Bam Do was a manager of a Korean theater in Kazakhstan. Um, so I wonder if he was already a recognized figure in the world of, of, um, of theater among the Soviet Koreans. And my last question, I couldn't help but to think about Victor Choi, the most important and famous rock musician in the Soviet Union during the Glasnost period. So... Do you think this deep musical heritage of Soviet Koreans, as demonstrated by Polichotol, is this the context that made possible the emergence of Victor Choi? Because the Soviet Koreans valued, preserved, and practiced music and art in daily life. I mean, you know, uh, the most important rock pop star in the Soviet Union was a, a Korean person, Victor Choi. And I see a, a connection here that, that the culture that the Soviet Koreans embraced and fostered, it enabled you know, someone like Victor Choi, that generation, um, you know, in the 1980s. So thank you very much, Professor Yang. Fascinating paper. Yeah. Thank you, Harrison. That is wonderful.
first discussion. Is there any question in our audience? Okay, please. Okay, uh, yeah, um, I really enjoyed uh, listening to your interesting presentation. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm uh, very curious about the. Um, Excuse me, but would you please make a little bit distance between your mouth and the microphone? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so in conclusion, you said that uh, yeah, after the downfall of Soviet Union, uh, the preservation of um, this traditional Korean identity uh, was a uh, was a little bit um, of uh, not a little bit, but it was affected in uh, in some ways. But I'm very curious if uh, the downfall of un uh, Soviet Union meant the total fragmentation of this uh, construction of Korea, traditional Korean identity among Soviet Koreans. So, yeah. Thank you very much. You. In the interest of time, I'm very sorry uh, with this many questions, probably you need more time, but can you uh, answer in two minutes? Uh, yes, two minutes. <laughs> yes, thank you. So first of all, Professor Harrison Kim, I would, I would take a moment to thank you for listening my presentation and reading my manuscript carefully. Your questions and comments and generally feedback are hugely appreciated. They have provided very important and invaluable insights for me as I develop my research further. Uh, I will, unfortunately, I cannot answer every your questions on, for instance, so I will answer a few questions uh, the first of all, the size of Balita Jail is around 2,700 hectares. And the population, the people says, the population of Balita Jail was 5,000 Korean, Soviet Koreans. But, but these statistic, statistics were need to check. So I need, I hope that I will tell you a little bit later more concrete Con concrete information. And Huang Mangum was born, oh, yes, I will skip that. Mm. Oh, and the questions. So I'm, now I'm so nervous. So after the collapse of Soviet Union, it's totally different history for Soviet Koreans because 1981, the South Korea and Uzbekistan have we reestablished the diplomatic relationship. The beef, the, during the Soviet Union, there between Soviet Korean and South Korean, there is no diplomatic in, relationship. But after nineteen, after nineteen, oh, nine, 91, 91, only so Soviet Koreans meet and know South Korean culture. So instead, North Korean culture, the Soviet Koreans. No, knew the South Korean culture. So the new period was started, the South Korean culture period, the Renaissance of Korean culture. Mm -hmm. So I hope that oh, we have a, an opportunity to talk about in person. So maybe Professor Song, a big specialist of Uzbek Koreans, <laughs> helped me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yang. You are so wonderful. And uh, I didn't know that we have this many interesting aspects to consider. And those unanswered questions we will follow up later. Thank you very much. Our uh, fi uh, last but not least uh, presenter uh, speaker is Professor Saguli from Ina University. He earned his uh, PhD. Uh, degree from University of Oxford and master degree from University of Minnesota Law School and also from Korea University. Uh, his presentation is titled Dynamic Democracy, Political Transitions, and the Problem of Using International Law in Korea. Afterward, uh, attorney at law, Mr. Jae Young Lee, will serve as a discussant.
Please go ahead. Good evening. Uh, good afternoon. You know, when I come to the Hawaii, always uh, uh, to speak at uh, at the conference. I try to not to go to beach before the conference, and uh, uh, you know, I always uh, the regrets and you know, I always failed. And uh, uh, thank you very much for the uh, organizer to invite me uh, to part of this program. You know, from the uh, afternoon session, I uh, sitting here. And uh, if I know the, the program, uh, more details, uh, I may uh, present a different one to, to make a whole program focus on the uh, immigration and migration issues in Korea. The missing part, uh, because uh, I hear that the five presentation, I think the uh, common keyword uh, interact of those papers, maybe migration and uh, immigration. I think the one of the uh, the most important the uh, the salient issues uh, from the outset is the uh, refugee issues in Korea. Right now in Korea, the uh, domestically we have a uh, uh, hotly debated whether we have to change the uh, refugee act, uh, and uh, that is the maybe um, uh, uh, make uh, this conference more healthier. And uh, uh, I know that the uh, uh, Professor Beck uh, should be very busy because to celebrate uh, 120 years of the anniversary of the Korean immigrant to Hawaii. And uh, uh, likewise, uh, uh, I'm involved in a couple of the conference or academic activities between two institutions like a UH and uh, in Han University. As uh, uh, Professor Lee of uh, Inhan University mentioned in the beginning of this uh, uh, the conference as a welcoming speech, Inha is a take two names, uh, two city names, uh, one from Incheon and Hawaii. It's a very unique context from the uh, Korean the, uh, uh, educational system and also the, uh, the history. I'm hoping that uh, with the strong leadership of the two institutions, uh, heydays, if I call, uh, to back to again, uh, to revitalize the uh, two institutions, the cooperation more. Uh, I know that since uh, uh, time is very short, uh, uh, some people want to go to the happy hour signature. And uh, so I'll be quick uh, uh, to present what I prepared today. However, I should take a, 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 a you know, very uh, special thanks to the, uh, maybe all these men in this room, uh, Professor Adolf Schultz, uh, and not leave uh, until my uh, uh, speech. And, uh, 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 as you know, uh, as somebody know uh, from the uh, news from the University of Hawaii, uh, Professor Schulz uh, will come to Korea to uh, to receive as a uh, as a recipient one of the prestigious the award called the Yongje Award, which follows the name of the first president of the Yonsei University uh, for his uh, lifetime, the contribution of the history, uh, Korean history. And in particular, a certain period of time, it's 913, uh, uh, 100 years of the Korea dynasty. So my special thanks should go to Professor Schultz. Uh, he'll buy a drink uh, uh, maybe someday. <laughs> uh, today, actually, uh, what I want to focus on is that the, uh, you know, uh, the democracy and the dynamics and the uh, perspective of international law in Korea, the uh, caused some of the issues. Uh, I, I provide my papers, uh, various salient issues where international law is uh, interacted uh, together. But uh, geopolitical location in Korea is a very, very unique. Uh, uh, sometimes I call that it's not uh, very good because as you know that the South Korea is surrounded by the major, major power of the world, like uh, you know, uh, Japan, China, Russia, and also North Korea. No country is not small at all. So that, uh, like uh, uh, Korea, which uh, uh, more than 99% the trade is uh, relied on the seaborne trade, the keeping that the, uh, uh, the security and the safety in order is very much important. So daily basis, how they dealing with uh, their neighboring states is uh, the most important the, uh, the job for the, uh, for the diplomacy and uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You know, whenever I come to the Hawaii, it's a no states, uh, 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 you know, you can find the, your, your neighboring. It uh, it's a quite a, makes you quite a peace. However, Korea is not the situation. And the, the problem is that 
except Korea, except Korea, which is, I believe that the only one state uh, we can call the democracy, a democratic society in Asia, in particular Northeast Asia, has changed the government on a regular basis. You know, sometimes the change of government on a regular basis is good, but sometimes it's not good. In particular, the consistency or uniformity of the foreign relations with the other states is, uh, is the issue. As you know, that we have a new government uh, from the last year. I, I will not talk about specific things of the, uh, the perspective of the, this new government in comparison with the previous government because uh, people have a different understanding or different perspective. But the problem is that uh, the government change, like what, in, what happened in Korea is uh, five years. If the foreign policy or the uh, uh, foreign relations with the neighboring states they change, significantly or dramatically, that has the issue. In, in a paper, uh, I put that a couple of the issues, for example, what Korea has with our neighboring states. As you know, that the most important issues uh, in Korea right now is that how they're dealing with the so-called the uh, post-colonial issues. We have, uh, I think, the Korea government right now, they're seriously working with the Japanese government to solve the, uh, the past issues in particular the forced labor compensation. As you know that the, the judicial decisions of the Supreme Court is uh, 2012 is uh, uh, was the was the, uh, uh, issues and how we interpret that decision uh, from the domestic level and the international level is not uh, is not the same, but it put that to tricky. In the, in the uh, year before 2011, the consular courts the, uh, uh, made a decision, say, the, uh, uh, the government not to try to resolve that uh, comfort home issues, military sexual issues with, uh, with Japan is uh, unconstitutional. So the old issues from the, the law the, from the uh, post uh, the, uh, colonialism uh, is still, still on the table at this moment. If you look at the uh, Korean the, uh, uh, international legal issues, uh, Korean international issues, uh, foreign uh, 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 diplomacy, largely based on the bilateral. We not uh, Korea is not the state the, uh, based on the multilateralism. We're dealing with a daily basis how we're dealing with our neighboring states. So how we address this is uh, uh, the very salient issues of the uh, in particular the forced labor. Japan believed that all issues is solved the, in 1965, the uh, 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 Korea-Japan, the basic treaty and the compensation agreement. And the Korea believed that uh, some issues is not resolved at all. And in, if you look at the document, which is revealed in uh, 2015, the negotiation whole process say that Japan want to resolve at everything uh, through that the treaty. However, the most important one is that the both sides cannot reach a certain agreement whether colonial period is legal or illegal. You know, uh, there, there can be a no agreement, no consensus uh, can be made. So that the both parties agree is that they agree to not to, uh, they agree to disagree, which means that just leave the questions. Korea have to, can interpret in their way and that Japan can interpret a different way. And the judicial bodies intervene, and that, that is the issues between two states. Right now, the 90% uh, uh, is uh, uh, the made progress from the uh, newspaper say. However, we do not know that the, what will be the final outcome. If they do not reach a final outcome, then the issues come up is, whether the Korean courts they could go uh, proceed to casualize of the asset of the Japanese so-called some of the company like a new, a new Nippon Spear, New Nippon Steel, and uh, Mitsubishi Company, what happened then? If that things exactly happen, the Japanese government should do something in the form of the diplomatic protection, which is the protect the uh, protect of the uh, 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 their uh, nationals and that their national state assets. So issues is that the move forward with the international level go beyond the domestic level. 
And the government decided both sides try to do to resolve the issues. But issue is that domestically, internally, that is not a resolution because the people believe that their compensation was not made at all. So right now, the, what both countries try to do is that through the third party, the third party, the pay uh, payments, which is the government involved, is that all issues resolved then? But then the other issues, since I already got the design uh, for the, the times uh, very limited. As you know, that the, the, uh, in the next the April, in the sometime after next April, the Japan will release the Fukushima water uh, waste into the sea. The problem is that Japan uh, believe that that release is quite safe in the United States, IAEA, and other agencies support the Japanese act. However, people living in the neighboring is, is not comfortable at all. You know, we, we are uh, maybe faced with having uh, uh, the fishes which is intoxicated or unsafe. However, you know, think about the, the strategy of the whole, whole story here is that if the compensation issues is not resolved before the Fukushima water waste issues come up, then government handled that the two story at the same time. It is quite a daunting task. I believe that it is not an easy one. But if, the luckily, from my own point of view as an international uh, perspective, is that luckily two sides agreed that the uh, you know, composed labor, the compensation is just settled down by certain means, and then Fukushima issues happen. The two states, Korea Japan's relations, has a two scenario. One, if the Japan release Fukushima water waste into the sea, but Korea government do not take action, then internally, Korea government will face very serious protest. The protest will be very much serious. And if that things happen, but Korea government to take action against Japan, for example, uh, uh, provisional measures based on the United Nations Convention Law of the Sea or the international legal level, and then Korea Japan's relations is uh, 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 getting worse again because Japan believed that these compensation issues settle down if, because Japan embrace or Japan understand the Korean position on this matter. So, what I want to make a message here is that, uh, uh, so my presentation is that the government changed on a very regular basis uh, because Korea believed that democratic society may be uh, uh, too democratic. So every five years, maybe 10 years, government changed. However, the treaty or the foreign relations level cannot change every five years if the things uh, conclude by the form of the treaty. So international law or the relations with the foreign state should be stable or should be uh, 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 continuously maintained. However, if domestic factors involve, the whole things are, 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 are quite, uh, quite uh, difficult to resolve. And other issues I mentioned in my paper is about what happened to create relations with China. As you know, the Taiwan Strait issues is not only uh, a cover, only touch upon the U.S. relations with China. If Taiwan Strait happened, then some of the U.S. forces should go to the Taiwan area. Then the role of the Korean the soldiers, the military, is, uh, is, uh, is, should be changed. Like now that there is a negotiation or talk inside of Korea, what happened in, in, in relations between China and Taiwan and their impact on, on Korean Peninsula. At the same time, the uh, Korean relations with North Korea was changed dramatically. You know, so dramatic. So if I wrote something uh, uh, a month ago, it should be updated, revised again and again because the things happening in Korea is a too dramatic change so often. So, uh, in the final conclusion, I want to convey uh, because uh, uh, 
you know, state practice curriculum, uh, Korean the uh, government to show is quite difficult because, you know, in international law, state practice is the most important factor to evaluate certain states' activities how, when they engage with the foreign state. However, state practice in, in Korea to change quite often so that it's quite difficult to pin down this is what is a Korean foreign policy and that this is what Korea they move forward. So uh, I want to say that the domestic intervention, despite the fact that what governments are uh, in, in power, uh, their intervention of the international relation it should be should be minimized, so that the, from the outset, uh, these governments, the long-term uh, perspective of the foreign relations should maintain should maintain the continuously without hassle. So I, you know, I uh, a bit rush, but I hoping that uh, uh, my uh, paper presentation uh, gave you the enough to to convey what I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Lee, very, very timely and insightful presentation. Mr. Jae Young Lee, please. He is a, a Tony at Law graduate of a William S. Richardson School of Law, and he is also a graduate of Korea University Law School as well. Um, <clears throat> hello. Uh, my name is Jae Young Lee. Um, uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Professor Lee, for sharing very informative presentation today. Uh, I'm really honored to join this conference as discussant for this Professor Sogo Lee. He is a renowned scholar in the field of international law. Um, my discussion will focus on the first subject of Professor Lee's presentation on understanding the enforcement of judgment on forced labor during the Japanese colonial period. Um, while I generally agree with the Professor Lee's analysis, I would like to delve further into a few points made by the Supreme Court back in 2018. Uh, the dissenting opinion of the Supreme Court uh, 2018 ruling provides that regardless of whether the individual's right is extinguished or not, the right to claim reparations for damages, damages arising from forced labor by filing a lawsuit against a Japanese national shall not be allowed. This is because the substantive right to claim and the procedural right to bring the case to the court are two different rights under the court system. The dissent uh, believed the procedural right is extinguished even though the substantive right might still exist. In other words, at least procedurally, the victims of the victims of a forced labor cannot bring the suit before the court. Um, the language of a Korean-Japan Basic Relations Treaty is pretty clear, and as uh, Professor Lee pointed out in his presentation, the minute fully supports this interpretation of the dissent. Nonetheless, the majority opinion of the Supreme Court ruled the treaty did not terminate the victim's right to open a suit, reasoning since the Japan and Korea never agreed on illegality of the colonial era. Uh, that's why there could be no compensation for the first label victims uh, without this consensus. This consensus is a prerequisite to assuming legal accountability and therefore Japan could not have had intention to compensate victims through this treaty. Simply put, according to majority, you cannot extinguish right if these rights are not specifically recognized in the treaty. Uh, however, as uh, mentioned above, um, the language in the treaty is pretty clear. So any claim against Japanese nationals are restricted under this treaty. So it would be reasonable to interpret that language. Even though the specific right was not recognized in the treaty, the victim's right to bring a suit could be could be extinguished by the treaty. Um, thinking about this, I became curious. The uh, justices of Supreme Court of South Korea are pretty smart people. Uh, why, the, despite this clear language in the treaty, why the majority opinion of Supreme Court held otherwise, uh, seemingly making unreasonable decision. 
I think we can find a clue in the conquering opinion. The conquering opinion's main argument was that even the nations can extinguish uh, the claims of their citizens through the treaty. Courts should apply a, a higher standard of scrutiny when those rights concern the gross violation of human rights, again emphasizing the illegality of Japanese colonial occupation. Um, even though the majority and the conquering opinion did not clearly connect these two points in this ruling, um, uh, two opinions share a very crucial concept, that is illegality of the forced labor. If we go deeper beyond the logic of the language, um, um, reading between the lines, I sense that uh, the court, even the dissenting, uh, seemingly agrees that justice for the victims of uh, forced labor has never fully served. I think this is because the legality of forced labor has never been fully recognized, uh, at least from the perspective of victims. Uh, as Professor Lee pointed out, the South Korean government has failed to follow up on the Korean-Japan Basic Relations Treaty, and I think it has failed by prematurely concluding the issue at a national level without uh, resolving the issue of illegality of anti-human rights crime back in 2065. Uh, there are currently more than 10 cases similar to this case in, pending in lower courts of South Korea. I think this shows the victims still feel the justice for them was never served, um, just as justices of the Supreme Court felt back in 2018. Um, I think the first step of reconciliation in the theory of social justice is a recognition that fully accepts its uh, reality of what uh, has occurred. Uh, I would like to suggest including one more step to the solution that Professor Lee suggested today. Uh, defendants of Supreme Court's case, together with the Japanese and Korean government, must begin a reconciliation process with victims so that our judiciary does not feel the need to intervene uh, the political communication again. I think that was the reason why that um, uh, our court felt that um, the failure of um, political communication pushed itself, its um, overstep its logical boundary. Thank you for um, uh, sharing your uh, view on the issue on international um, matter that Korea currently facing today, Professor Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Just a moment. Let me move this a little backward. Somehow it is not locked. So among audience, do you have any question? I'm sorry that we are behind our schedule, but we are almost there. So if you have any question, please raise your hand. Otherwise, I would like to ask Professor Lee to give his uh, answer as well as a final comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I, uh, I want to put that the uh, two things more. Uh, I already mentioned about uh, the uh, both sides, the Korea-Japan's uh, understanding of the legality uh, uh, in terms of the uh, Japanese colonization period of the Korea. And, uh, it is uh, it is issues that both parties cannot uh, uh, agree. So that the uh, the uh, 1965 the basic treaty was the outcome of the uh, understanding, the fact that they cannot agree the very nature of the colonial period, and uh, uh, the other issues is that diplomatic protection in international law is not uh, individual rights. It is a state right, and the states can exercise. Uh, uh, on behalf of the uh, individual, the people. The problem is that in a 1965, the think about 1965, when the, uh, our, our uh, Professor Schultz come to Korea uh, as a member of PISCO to teach English in high school in Korea, you know, in that period, I, 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 I bit sense, uh, you know, sympathetic about the negotiator Korean parties uh, at the time. You know, think about 1965 in, in Korea. There's nothing we have. The money Japan wants to deliver to the individual, the victims, individual claimants. But the, is it the Korean government to receive as a lump sum payment and they use the part of the money for the development of the Korean economy? 
The issues come to Korea is that right now that there was issues that Korea government have to clarify because that is already revealed by the uh, various documents. They have to do something to give a sincere policy for the victims, and they embrace them the very, uh, you know, various means. You know, it, this the Korea government, the uh, I think the economic power is, is not like the 1965. The Korea government should be more candid about about uh, uh, you know negotiation period to the people, and then the. Uh, you know, there are various uh, the claims or the court cases right now involve the, uh, the various the, uh, the steps of the Korean the, uh, judicial bodies. And that it should be resolved by the specific act to resolve the whole issues, uh, which are related with the post-colonial issues. And in, in some sense, this is a, a bit uh, uh, the story for the Korean government, to, uh, uh, what they're doing in these days, because the actors on these issues that Korea government and the Japanese government is a state level. But what Korea government right now doing is that they are working on behalf of the Korean victims and the play not significantly uh, on on uh, for the for the Korean people. Yeah, from the outset, that is a, a bit the missing part. However, if you look at the, I, I'm talking about the state practice because the state practice is the most important factors in international law. If you look at the Japanese state practice, the Japanese state practice, Japan has a, you know, a bit long history working in the international in comparison in Korea. They have their own empire, even if there is a colonial uh, uh, you know, legacy they left to us. The Japanese state practice that they follow the international, they, uh, uh, so that they have a minimum level of the legality they want to keep. The one thing I, uh, I feel very sorry of Japanese practice is that they lacking of the morality. What happened in Fukushima and the, what happened about their activities at the part of the, uh, the events. Japanese step practices go with the legality of the international law. However, they do not show that the, their morality which, go with the, uh, which should go with the legality. That's what happened uh, at this time. What Japan says is that everything is done. It is job for you to take care. However, if you look at the uh, colonial period and the, what happened in Korean society, if Japan uh, can move a bit forward, I don't think these issues can go to this long way. That is a, a bit, a bit, uh, 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 sorry for the, uh, if I, uh, uh, you know, criticize of the Japanese set practice of the international law, in particular with uh, their neighboring state. So, uh, in, in bottom line, uh, again, uh, you know, as I mentioned that there are many issues involved uh, uh, in Korea with the neighboring state at the bilateral level. And, uh, however, in, uh, in the new governments, uh, I should be very careful to say that, but it, uh, it seems to me uh, new government is uh, working for against everything uh, uh, of the previous governments. I understand, but if that is the involved the international relations in a diplomacy, the outcome is uh, not great as they expect because uh, there are other parties to play, and uh, that is not the government, the scope of the work. So the government intervention of the domestic uh, international affairs should be limited as much as, uh, as they can. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. So with this, we will conclude today's conference. Very long day, but we learned a lot. Thank you again.